Good morning and welcome to BWXT's 2021 Investor Day. I'm Mark Kratz, Vice President of Investor Relations. I joined the company about four years ago, which was coincidentally the last time we hosted an Investor Day. So we're uh, grateful to be back today and very grateful to be back live. It's good to be with you this morning. We appreciate the opportunity to speak with the investment community. We value the time and interest of both our current investors as well as new potential investors. There's a lot of unique and compelling activity going on across BWXT, and I'm particularly enthusiastic about the outlook for the company. This morning, we have an exciting event planned for you, where you'll gain further insight into the business, the strategy, and the vision this management team has for BWX Technologies. Today's presentation is being webcast live, which is available on the BWXT website and in yesterday's press release. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. For those attending in person in the event of an emergency, please follow NYSE personnel to the exits. There's a staircase located by the elevator bank in the rear of the room, and there's also another emergency exit down the hallway to my right. During today's presentation, we'll do discuss certain matters that constitute forward-looking statements. Those statements involve risks and uncertainties that are described in the safe harbor provision found in today's earnings materials and also the company's SEC filings. We will also make reference to non-GAAP financial measures, which are reconciled to GAAP measures in the appendix of this material. Turning to today's agenda, you'll have the opportunity to hear from several members of our executive leadership team, all having played important roles in BWXT's success during its first year, six years as a standalone public company. Rex Jevedin will lead today's discussion with an overview and strategy, followed by Dr. Rob Smith, President of Government Operations, who will discuss the company's two operating segments that are focused on government solutions. We will also hear from John McQuarrie, President of Nuclear Power Group, who will discuss the company's commercial operations, including nuclear power, and also Martin Coombs, President of BWXT Medical, who will discuss the company's strategy in nuclear medical manufacturing. Lastly, our new CFO, Rob LeMasters, will present the company's financial strategy. We'll take a short break around 10.30 a.m., and we will hold a Q&A session at the end of today's meeting. Please hold your questions for the end. For those attending online, you can submit your questions at any point during the presentation. I will moderate the Q&A and we'll take questions from both the live audience as well as those attending virtually. In addition to the presenters today, you will also hear from a couple other members of the executive management team. Susie Sterner, Senior Vice President of Government Relations and Communications. Joel Dooling, President of Nuclear Operations Group and Ken Camplin, President of Nuclear Services Group. Before we begin, we would like to share a short video highlighting BWXD's unparalleled capabilities through its strong employee base, rich history, and drive for innovation. At BWX Technologies, the power of innovation is infinite. BWXT has been at the forefront of nuclear technology since the industry was born. Today, we're using our expertise to deliver solutions across the seas, over four continents, and into outer space. A U.S. company based in Virginia, we own and operate major nuclear production sites throughout North America, including the only two commercial plants licensed by the U.S. government to process the highest enrichments of uranium. As a global leader in naval nuclear propulsion, our products are proven and powerful. BWXT is the only manufacturer of nuclear reactors and fuel for the U.S. Navy's fleet of submarines and aircraft carriers. These components are a vital part of the U.S. Navy's operations, and our employees take immense pride in performing this mission-critical work. 
BWXT is a trusted provider of environmental management services to the U.S. Department of Energy, making significant contributions to a cleaner environment. Our teams also manage extremely complex operations at national laboratories and NASA production and testing facilities. We're experts in uranium-bearing materials for advanced nuclear applications. For decades, BWXT has supplied nuclear fuel to U.S. national laboratories and universities for research purposes, and we continue to perfect our techniques to provide power and propulsion for advanced nuclear reactors. In Canada, BWXT assembles components in the largest nuclear clean room in North America, delivering more than 300 steam generators worldwide. Our commercial nuclear products help power 60% of the homes and businesses in Ontario and more around the world with reliable clean energy. You see, delivering essential and trusted nuclear solutions is not just our purpose, it's our legacy, and we keep building on it. Through our nuclear medicine business, we're developing new innovations for life-saving therapies that will position BWXT as a global leader in the industry. And already, we're improving the lives of patients through the development and production of nuclear medicine products that help diagnose and treat serious disease. We're also designing a mobile micro-reactor to provide immediate, robust power generation for defense applications, remote communities, and critical infrastructure. And BWXT's advanced engineering work extends beyond this planet, from creating the power to propel astronauts to Mars, to providing the power they'll need when they get there. The new future of space exploration is in our grasp. We're passionate about employing nuclear technology to solve some of the world's most important problems. And our people are some of the brightest minds in the industry, driven by the infinite power of innovation to create a safe and sustainable future for us all. Proud of our past, inspired by the present, and excited about what's next. We're BWX Technologies, and we are people strong. Innovation driven. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce Rex Jevedin, BWXT's President and Chief Executive Officer. Thank you, Mark, and uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, good morning to everybody that's here live. Good to see all of you, and also uh, to all, all of those who have joined us online. Uh, I'm glad to be back on the, at the Stock Exchange. The last time I was here was December of 2015. We were down on the floor of the exchange up in the balcony ringing the bell to uh, commemorate the launch of BWXT as a public company. There was still a bull out in front of the building at the time. I had joined in uh, October of 2015. Uh, very excited about the future of the company at that time. That excitement was well-founded as it happens. We've been on quite a journey for the last six years, and I can't wait to see what the next six years uh, hold for us as a company. When you look at uh, BWXT as a company, I think it's fair to say that our identity is that we're a nuclear manufacturing and technology company. Uh, but we also like to talk about our corporate purpose, and you got a tease of that in the, in the video. Our corporate purpose is to employ nuclear technology to attack some of the most important problems that face us uh, as a nation and as a globe. Uh, for example, we use nuclear technology to provide for global security, and we're very proud about that. We use nuclear technology to produce clean energy, particularly through our uh, Canadian commercial nuclear power business. We enable the exploration and future habitation of space with nuclear technology. Uh, we produce nuclear medicines to diagnose and treat uh, very challenging diseases such as heart disease and cancer. And we use nuclear technology to, um, to uh, perform nuclear environmental remediation for our government customers uh, at uh, legacy Cold War sites, and we're very proud of that fact as well. When you look at the history of this company, I think it's fair to say that we've made our money in manufacturing. Uh, but we've, our growth has been driven by innovation. It's taken us into, into new markets uh, and created new and interesting opportunities for us. And so this chart here kind of depicts that innovation history. It goes back 165 years uh, to Babcock and Wilcox, which is the originating company, uh, to Stephen Cox's um, uh, patent of the water tube boiler, which, uh, which revolutionized both the safety and performance of, of steam generating power systems at the time 
our nuclear history goes back literally 75 years back to supporting with both with technology and manufacturing uh, the Nautilus submarine, which is the world's first nuclear submarine, uh, and into the modern era of BWXT launch uh, starting in 2015, where we're using nuclear technology to design new fail-safe fuels, for example. We've done innovations around medical isotopes. We're designing a mobile reactor for the Department of Defense. We're designing a space reactor for NASA. And so that innovation DNA that we have is what's leading us into these new and exciting markets and creating new growth verticals for us that were not available before. Now this chart here uh, depicts really our value proposition, which is that there are unique differentiators in this company, uh, BWXT. And I'm using the term precisely here. I mean truly unique in the sense that we have unmatched credentials to participate in these markets. Uh, we have an unmatched history. I think that was demonstrated by that last chart. And we also have capacity that a number of our competitors do not possess. And that leads us into superior competitive positioning uh, in most of the markets and most of the opportunities and where we play. Um, in fact, we're a, sole, we're a sole source supplier on a number of our franchise programs. And there's very limited competition in some of our other programs because of the, the very high barriers to entry into these kind of businesses and markets. You'll be hearing from our uh, executive team, our proven team uh, throughout the day. Uh, about these differentiators and how it leads us into our competitive positioning. And you'll also be hearing about uh, the innovations that I mentioned and how they're driving our future growth. And I think uh, when you hear all this, you'll agree that uh, BWXT is certainly a compelling investment opportunity uh, poised for future growth. We're going to present our business into two primary uh, components today. Uh, the first one being the government component. Uh, that'll be represented by Rob Smith, who's sitting down in front here. You'll hear from Rob later on. Uh, he's the president of, of government operations, and that contains two uh, segments of the business. One is nuclear operations, which contains our flagship uh, nuclear Navy business, but also has some other interesting components that are providing for some growth, including uh, strategic nuclear materials and also specialty fuels. Uh, he'll also be describing the nuclear services group, uh, which is the home of our technical, our historical technical services piece that does management and operations and nuclear environmental remediation, primarily for government clients. Um, but it's also the home of our advanced technologies group. And so you see the micro reactor uh, work going on here, some of the advanced uh, fuel developments going on in this group. And it's the isotope technology that's driven our medical, our entrance into uh, and uh, nuclear medicine uh, originated from this group. And it functions really as kind of the central R&D hub for, for BWX technologies. And then you'll hear uh, in our commercial business, uh, which is represented by the Nuclear Power Group, you'll be hearing from uh, John McQuarrie, who's sitting out front here, and he'll be describing um, all the components of that business, including our component manufacturing fuel and services and other things that we do in the market. And then he'll hand it over to Martin Coombs, uh, who, will, uh, who runs the nuclear medicine business, and will be describing uh, our position in that market. So we'll give you a lot more color around nuclear medicine. I think a number of you have been uh, anticipating that. So when you look at the businesses that we have grouped into government and into commercial components, uh, they're very different in some ways, very obviously. Um, but what they have in common are the set of differentiators that we have uh, listed in this kind of wagon wheel chart. Uh, these businesses uh, produce products that are what we call high consequence. Generally, that means they operate in complex environments, challenging environments, and they absolutely cannot fail. Uh, they're also products that, have, that are highly engineered, high product complexity. They're built to exacting quality standards. There is logistical complexity uh, because we are handling nuclear materials in the forms of, of fuels and special materials and, and medical isotopes in some cases. Um, and sometimes these businesses uh, have high capital intensity associated to them. So all that, what, what all that means is that these products are hard to make. Uh, and because of that, there aren't that many players, and because of that, it discourages competitive entry. And so there's this whole set of positive characteristics that sort of comes with that, uh, with that, with that set of uh, qualities. And those are things like these are very long cycle businesses uh, where you can get into a superior competitive position and put, put a pretty deep moat around your business. Uh, in the way that we've constructed this business, we have really no effective exposure to global CapEx and GDP cycles. Uh, just none of our businesses are sensitive to that. 
we have highly visible backlogs and we have a certain amount of pricing power uh, that shows up in our margins. And so, um, so, so this, is the, this is the kind of business that we're in. This is the kind of business that we like to be in. And we look for vectors of growth. We're looking for this set of characteristics, high product complexity, heavily regulated, in other words, hard stuff. So how are we doing as a company? I think we've, we've put together a, a track record that's, uh, that I would say is commendable uh, in our six years as a public company. We've been delivering on our commitments, keeping our customers satisfied, uh, maintaining our positions in our markets. We've been growing our core and we've got some shots on goal uh, to grow outside the core business and we'll be describing all that today. But, but to put it in financial terms, uh, we've improved the top line by 50% over that six year period. Uh, we have more than doubled the bottom line, going from a, a $1.42 a share to $3.03 uh, last year. We have been expanding our margins. We're up a couple hundred basis points from the time we spun as a public company. Uh, and uh, on top of all that, we've returned more than a billion to shareholders through, um, through dividends and through share repurchases. So I think we've been, as we've grown, uh, a shareholder-friendly company. Along the way, we've been picking up some uh, accolades and awards. Uh, we've, been named, uh, we've been named by Investors Business Daily the last two years a top ESG company. And in fact, in 2020, we were number one in the manufacturing category. Uh, we were named this year uh, for, for the year 2020 the number one manufacturer of the year uh, by Industry Week. Uh, we uh, found ourselves in the Fortune 1000 this year, and hopefully we'll wake up one day and find ourselves in the Fortune 500 as we grow this business and, and create this future for ourselves. And all the while, um, and this goes back uh, to, our, to our long, our long and, and I think impressive history, uh, we maintain best in class uh, ocean numbers. Our safety record is, is really unparalleled. We're always in the top quartile and generally we're around the 95th percentile of, or above in safety performance. And, uh, and that's uh, something we have to focus on given the heavy manufacturing work that we do and given the, the, the nuclear qualities of our business. The nuclear business, the nuclear markets are, are actually um, creating a lot of excitement and attracting a lot of potential entrants. It's hard to get in the business for the reasons that I said earlier, but there are a lot of people that are sniffing around these, around these markets because, uh, because the, the climate goals, clean energy, carbon reduction goals, are driving a lot of interest in commercial nuclear power. We're poised to take advantage of that, and you'll hear that from John McCory later on, but... Um, so clean energy is really driving interest in nuclear. Uh, nuclear medicine is a, is a market that will grow uh, maybe explosively, is not too, too provocative a word to use, uh, particularly around therapeutics, and you'll be hearing about, uh, hearing about that from Martin Coombs later. Um, we, have these, we have this new market in space and defense reactors, uh, and it's creating a lot of interest because there, there are classes of problems uh, in national security and space that are begging for a nuclear solution. By the way, by the way, this market didn't exist six years ago when we were a public company, when we came out as a public company. Um, so, so for all that reason, there's a lot of interest in, in the nuclear markets, and there's a bunch of startups uh, that, are, that are trying to enter these markets, and they have big ideas, and they have PowerPoint slide decks that are impressive, uh, and they've got paper reactors, which are hard to beat because they're cheap and they're easy to build. Um, and so, so that's the sort of competitive... Uh, uh, the competitive landscape that we find ourselves in. But what I say about our business is, look, this is the killer differentiator right here on this chart. We have um, decades of nuclear operations experience, and nobody has the experiential qualifications that can match that. And these are hard businesses to execute. These are hard products to make, I've argued earlier. And people that haven't been in the business don't have the, the experiential qualifications to judge how hard it is. We have world-class manufacturing facilities. What you're seeing on this chart is a, is a beautiful sort of a sunset view of our plant in Lynchburg, Virginia. Uh, that's where we do a lot of the nuclear Navy work. They're inside the fence, there are about 2,200 employees there. But we have 12 such plants across North America. Uh, five of them are in the U.S., which are primarily the nuclear Navy plants, and we have seven in Canada. And of these 12 plants, six of them handle nuclear materials in some form, whether that's nuclear fuels or special nuclear materials or medical radioisotopes. And the other six are manufacturing uh, nuclear qualified products. And so this is an unmatched footprint. It's a deep capability. 
and it's the way that we beat that startup competition that is so interested in these markets. It's with our capabilities that we can assert into the market. We're, we are also highly credentialed in, an, in a unique and important way. We're the only company to possess these category, in, uh, category one NRC licenses which permit us to handle special nuclear materials. It's the only such license that exists. Uh, and because of all of these reasons, we find ourselves, as I mentioned earlier, in a sole sourced position on a lot of these mission critical programs, and that's a good place to be. So when you look at these two um, components of the business, our, our government business and our commercial business, there are uh, significant growth drivers in all of these businesses and in all of these markets, and you'll hear about it throughout the day, but it's, uh, it's fair to say that our core business is growing nicely in all cases, in our new businesses around nuclear medicine and space defense reactors and other such things uh, are also in a position to grow, uh, and that story will unfold today. Now, this chart focuses on generating shareholder value. I've been saying since I came into the CEO job that I think there's a pretty simple way to think about what a CEO is supposed to do with a business, uh, and it's really just two basic jobs. One is to run the business as well so that they generate cash. That's job one. And job two is to take the capital that's created and invest it in such a way that it creates long-term shareholder value. That's, that's really it. That's the bottom line of it. There are important things to do, such as team building, communications, business development, addressing ESG concerns, board relationships, understanding the competitive environment. You have to do all those things too, but they're all subordinate to these two things. These two things are run the business to generate cash, invest that, invest that cash wisely. It sounds uh, conceptually simple, but you have to overlay strategy on top of this to make, that, to make it work. Uh, and that's what leads you to this concept here. How do we do that? I think we would say that, that we're using a disciplined three horizon strategy to build our future. So we think about uh, an execute phase of the business, which is to run our core businesses um, to generate cash, as I said on the prior chart. And we do that by focusing on our customers and deploying our existential capabilities into the market. And then we're trying to expand in, into nuclear adjacencies. I think that's a real success story for BWXT, and that will unfold throughout the day. And we're doing that through technology innovation and by the assertion of, of our capabilities into these new markets. And then we're also exploring long cycle opportunities. Primarily those would be nuclear, but, we, but our aperture is open for other possibilities. Uh, and we're doing that through investing modestly, but investing meaningfully in R&D so that we can find other new horizons from the growth for, uh, for, for the growth of the company. Now, developing that idea a little bit further, if you take the prior chart and, and sort of clock, move it 90 degrees counterclockwise, then we can put these, uh, we can put these growth horizons uh, into a time scale, and you can see that along the bottom here. So obviously, uh, executing the core uh, businesses in the present time frame, that middle light gray stripe is is how we expand, and we think of that time frame as in the one to year, uh, one to four year time frame, and then the future one is five five years and and, and out. Uh, and so, uh, executing the core business, obviously, we're focused on naval nuclear propul propulsion. We're focused on um, our commercial nuclear power business, the DOE site management that we do, environmental and, and management and operations, and and we have an active uh, medical isotope portfolio that we have to execute. We're delivering products every day into the market. And that's our focus. Uh, but we're also um, building this next layer of shareholder value. By the way, I, I should say, when you think about the value perspective on that first piece, we think of it in terms of free cash flow and return on invested capital. And we get uh, measured and rewarded on that by, by our board of directors. But that's the value perspective there. Now that middle stripe one, uh, where we're doing the Tech 99 generators, uh, th certain therapeutics for nuclear medicine, uh, we may have an opportunity for global uh, nuclear power and propulsion, depending on what happens with this uh, trilateral security agreement between Australia, the UK, and the US called AUKUS. So that one's kind of interesting. We've got with small modular reactors feel like a very real opportunity right now. Uh, and so what would happen with those businesses there is ideally we pull those into the core uh, and they become uh, present businesses at some point in the very near future. I would tell you that as a CEO, one of the most challenging things that I face 
is maintaining conviction while you go, uh, go about building those future businesses because they consume cash. Sometimes they're capital intensive. Uh, they create expense and depreciation drag and they pull from your core business. And so it's important to maintain conviction through that phase as you build these new businesses because ultimately those migrate into the core uh, and we've got substantial uh, growth related to that in the future. And then finally in that explore phase, uh, by the way, and in that uh, expand uh, part, of the, uh, um, part of the growth horizon, we think of that value perspective in NPV because these businesses are not yet uh, generating meaningful cash or earnings. But when you discount the future cash flows, for example, on the radioisotope business, you're going to see what kind of value we're, we're creating there. And I think you're going to find it to be very compelling. And then finally, in that explore phase, this is really what we do with our R&D. It's the far out stuff. But already, we're seeing very interesting things there. For example, uh, we have a, a very novel, very interesting approach to radioisotope power systems. There's a new class of, of medical isotopes called Theranostics that combine uh, the diagnostic and the therapeutic isotopes together to both treat and image dis uh, disease states. Uh, so there are things that are out there that we know we can grow into and that creates a lot of excitement within the business as well. So where does all this leave us? Uh, when you think about the investment thesis for BWXT, uh, I think what you could say about it is, look, we have a set of core businesses that are very attractive. Uh, there are high barriers to entry, as I mentioned earlier. So these businesses have a fairly deep moat around them. Uh, they have, we have long-term visibility into these businesses. We can see our backlog in the Navy business uh, and the 30-year shipbuilding plan. You look, can look at the backlog in commercial nuclear power. These refurbishment projects go out for a decade and a half, and then the life of those reactors is extended 40 years. Those are the kind of businesses that we are in, uh, businesses that are uh, well defended uh, and have high visibility and generate cash. And then we've got the unique, uh, we've got the innovation DNA and the unique as assets to enable new growth verticals. Uh, that's what I talked about in the explore horizon of the business and beyond that. And then finally, we're entering a cash generation period, uh, rich cash generation period for the business. We've come off of two uh, large capital campaigns. We'll be rolling into a cash generating period and that, that would uh, position us for shareholder friendly investments and return of capital to shareholders. And, and that's, so I think it's a, a very compelling investment thesis, and we'll try to uh, unfold that as we go throughout, throughout the briefing today. What I'm going to do now is introduce uh, Dr. Rob Smith to you. Rob came to uh, BWXT in January this year at the peak of the pandemic, uh, comes to us from Lockheed Martin, where he's running a $2 billion portfolio, portfolio in radars and sensors, and he is the president of, of government operations, and we'll be des describing the two segments that I uh, outlined earlier, so I'll turn it over to you, Rob. Well, good morning. As Rex said, I'm Rob Smith, and uh, it's a real honor to be here at the New York Stock Exchange. I was thinking about it when I was walking up, and uh, this is my first time here. Unlike Rex, I, I haven't had the opportunity to be here before. And uh, I remember when I was a kid, and I would be you know, watching the news and seeing the tickers and the CEOs ringing the bell, and I always thought, I want to do that one day. And haven't quite got there yet, but it is, it is good to be here. Um, as Rex said, I'm from Lockheed Martin and uh, joined BWXT at the beginning of the year. And uh, I have to tell you that um, Lockheed is a great company. And what, but what really attracted me to BWXT <clears throat> was just the great business with the competitive advantages. And Rex really talked a lot about that. And I saw a great opportunity for growth in the government operations business. And now that I've been here, for, uh, I guess, almost a year, I have more conviction than ever that we are going to deliver on that growth. Leadership really makes a difference. And when I interviewed, I was really impressed with the camaraderie of the leadership team, how they helped each other. And BWXT is still small enough that leaders make a really big difference. And I feel like that's a big differentiator for us as we think about all of our stakeholders, our customers, our employees, and of course, all of you as shareholders. Let's see if I can figure out how to use this. <clears throat> so. What I'm going to talk to you about today is the business, the government operations business. I'm going to focus a lot on our future expectations and where we see this business going. And I hope at the end you'll see, as I do, that this is a growth business. 
I've never seen a business that has stronger visibility as our naval nuclear propulsion business with a 30-year shipbuilding plan. Our hard to replicate businesses and facilities and people, whether that's our Cat 1 facilities that Rex talked about, our people with their clearances, their knowledge, their experiences in the nuclear industry, as well as our overall credentials as a company being an owner op operator of nuclear facilities. Also, I'm gonna to touch on some growth vectors that we have. While our core businesses are fantastic, we do have some options for growth. We expect wins in our technical services business to get back to historical peak profitability over the medium term. We have sole source contracts in advanced reactor fuels. We're in competitions uh, for what we believe will be winner take all advanced reactors. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then we have also a new business that we call U-Metal or uranium conversion and purification. And we expect that to continue to grow and be a meaningful contributor to our business. Let me start with the Nuclear Operations Group, which is led by Joe Dooling. This is a $1.6 billion revenue business with about 5,000 employees. It operates in two markets, the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Market, as well as the nuclear fuels and uranium processing market. Over in NSG, our, our nuclear services group, that's led by Ken and Camplin, and you will um, hear from both of those in the panel later today. And that business, it has our technical services business and then our research lab, which we call advanced technologies that Rex talked about, which is the local, I mean, the centralized business or centralized organization, probably a better word to use, that does the research and development of the new products. And that's where our advanced technology and our advanced reactors are today. Our technical services business mostly operates through joint ventures and therefore is not consolidated uh, to, uh, to our financial statements. However, <clears throat> just to give you a little bit of a scale of a, you know, of a scope of a scale and size of this business, if you looked at the consolidated pieces of the nuclear services group, and then you looked at our percent ownership of our joint ventures, and you multiplied that by the you know, revenue and the employees, and then you added that together, you would have an $800 million business with about 2,500 employees. So what that means from a government operations level, looking at the consolidated business as well as the unconsolidated piece of the business, we have equivalent of about $2.5 billion in revenue and 7,500 employees. And this is about 90% of the operating income of BWXT as a whole. These two businesses share a culture of excellence, of nuclear credentials, and we are able to share those across these businesses. It's also a real big benefit to us when it comes to employee development, as we're able to <clears throat> move employees between these businesses, whether that's moving them into our TSG and going to DOE sites, running major operations there, or vice versa. It really helps us develop and create our next generation of leaders, which is going to be really important for us. Additionally, we're able to share security clearances and other employee credentials. Wrong button, okay. <clears throat> now I'm gonna talk specifically about our naval nuclear propulsion business. Rex talked about the competitive advantages and I think they are uh, just in spades in this naval nuclear propulsion. If you look at the engine room, which is the red box, we make the fuel, the reactor, the pressure, the pressure vessels, the control rod mechanism, the pressurizers, the steam generators, the heat exchangers. You could think of it as all of the mechanical equipment except for some pumps and valves. And we do this across all of the Navy platforms, both the Virginia and the Columbia, the nuclear platforms, both the subs, the Columbia and the Virginia, as well as the Ford and the Nimitz aircraft carrier. So we view all of these as franchise programs. And it's a real honor for us to be able to deliver all of those components into all of these platforms. 
I want to just spend a minute talking about each of these platforms and put some context around some, some comments and some perspectives that I'm going to share with you later. The Virginia, which is the fast attack submarine, has the least relative value to BWXT. What do I mean by that? When I'm talking about relative value, I'm saying what is an order of a Virginia? What is its impact on shop volume, revenue, and our operating earnings? Both all the Virginia, the Columbia, and the Ford are what I would say are in early stages of their manufacturing. And the Nimitz is now complete, and we are rolling off on the refueling. The Virginia and the Columbia have life of ship power units. So we put one power unit in, powers the ship till it's retired. The Ford and the Nimitz are both refueled at about half life at 25 years. The Ford, as you can see on the chart, has a very high relative value. So carrier orders have a, a large impact on the business, both shop volume, revenue, as well as operating earnings. A, re for a Nimitz reload and a Columbia are, are in between. One of the reasons why the Ford and the Nimitz have such a large impact is not only do they have two power units in each of them, but each of the power units is much larger, as I'm sure you can imagine. So again, I'm still on our naval nuclear propulsion business. So we have long-term visibility with a 30-year Navy shipbuilding plan <clears throat> that is published. I believe we have very strong support for our programs. As the country transitions from what historically has been, or most recently, been the global war on terror to uh, the peer, near-peer competition, if you will, from CENTCOM to the Pacific and Indo-PACOM, these platforms become more and more important for the defense of the country. The Columbia is the number one Navy acquisition priority. And that just bodes well for what we see over the next 30 years. So as many of you know, the Navy shipbuilding plan can change. It does change. It's not written in stone. Um, however, what we've seen is that there's been an acceleration and increases over the recent past to this plan. And we would expect you know, continued strong support for our platforms. So as I mentioned earlier, let me, there's one correction I need to say on this chart. Um, if you look at the, the Ford order, that was actually in BWXT 2020, not 2019. We, got, we were under contract in 19, but the order wasn't actually placed till 20. But what you'll see here is that BWXT, because of our long lead of the, the power systems that we provide, we get the order about two years or two years before the shipbuilders get their order. And also, you'll see on this that the last, with the last Ford being ordered in 2019 and the next one in 26, before we get back to a four-year cadence, is a headwind to the business. Again, that, if you look back and you say, you think about the size of a Ford carrier and the amount of volume and revenue that it drives, the fact that there was that gap is a headwind for us um, in the early 20s until you know, we, we get the next, the next Ford in the middle of the, the decade. That's partially offset by the Columbia ramp up, but not completely. Also want to note here that later you'll see some discussions about SSNX, which is the next Virginia attack submarine. I should also mention on this, on this prior chart, let me go back here. That you can see the growth that happens in the second half of the decade and on as the Ford ramps up and um, the, the Columbia becomes the full production. And, and I'll show you a little bit more about that and we'll talk about the implications of that in a later chart. I thought I would give you uh, Contracts 101, at least as it applies to our naval nuclear propulsion business. Typically, we get two or three year ordering period contracts with the customer. So we negotiate every two or three years. And in that agreement, we have the number of platform subs, carriers that the Navy would expect to buy in that two or three year period. 
These contracts were on over eight years. If you, let's just take a two year ordering period and then eight years to produce the power for systems and the other related components for a carrier, you easily see how you get to 10 year contracts. These are fixed price incentive fee contracts, meaning we agree on a price of a platform. And then if we are able to produce that for less, we share in the underrun and our operating income, our margins go up. If we overrun, then the, the customer also shares that with us, but our operating income and our margins go down. So it's really important for us that we have a culture, and we do, of continuous improvement, and we continue to drive innovation and efficiencies into the manufacturing process so we can continue to deliver, as we expect to, high teens operating margins in this part of the business. Typically, these are 15% fee um, as sold. So think of a return on sales of you know, 13 and a half or so. And we have multiple contracts running at the same time. Again, I think that's probably intuitive if you're doing it every two years on an eight year cycle, we have multiple running at the same time. And typically, we do have higher margins on contracts that have been running longer because we've had more time to drive innovation and cost synergies and other things into our business. Last point I want to make on this chart is that when we have demonstrated savings in the next multi-year agreement, the, whatever we've delivered in those savings are the baseline for negotiations of the next marketing agreement. So how do we drive the margins from as sold to the high teens? There's really three different ways. The first is through operating efficiencies. The second is through procurement savings. And the third is through cost management activities. Operational efficiencies, I mentioned this earlier, but we are always looking at bringing in new technologies. We're looking at how we can do things faster, how we can do things better without sacrificing quality. Because for us, quality has to be number one. These power units and systems, they go into you know, Navy platforms. They're all over the world, and they have to work. They have to work right, and they can't fail. Procurement savings, you could think of this as bulk buys to be able to, to get things lower than what we expected. And then cost management is typical for what you would generally see um, in most businesses. How do we manage our overheads? How do we manage the cost of labor, health care, and other expenses that are in the business? My expectation is that we will continue to effectively run this business and continue to deliver the high teens margins operationally that you have come to see in the past. You've seen this chart before. There's a couple of additional, uh, additional information in here that I, I want to share with you. And those two pieces of information are the fixed cost, the fixed infrastructure, as well as adding the refueling to the carrier. Because as you saw, carrier refueling is, a, is an important part of the business and has relatively large uh, value to us. When I talk about the fixed cost, I want you to understand that that's um, a little less than 50% of the total cost of our business. And it has a typical manufacturing cost that you would see in there, depreciation of equipment, facilities that would be in most manufacturing uh, companies. We also have additional costs in there, like NRC licenses, Nuclear Regulatory Commission licensing fees, um, as well as a guard force, given the fact that we have a Cat 1 facility and handle uh, nuclear materials that are highly enriched. This is critical that we protect that material. So this is a real large barrier to entry for others into the market because these fix, this fixed infrastructure would be required even if we only made one nuclear sub. We would also expect over time, we've, we've just finished a large capital, or finishing, it's not quite done yet, uh, a large capital investment in for our Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program. And that created capacity, growth capacity for us to be able to support this build plan. So over time, as we ramp up, and the, we, we continue to have the Columbias come on and the Fords on four-year ordering cadence, we would expect the variable cost to, to go down some, or the percentage of variable cost to our total cost to go down. We 
also, as I mentioned earlier, have headwinds because the Nimitz refueling is rolling off. And these headwinds will last through the middle of the decade. Um, they will be partially offset by Columbia. And we do have uh, inflationary pricing or escalation into our bids, which will create a situation where our, for our naval nuclear propulsion business, we expect over the five years to see revenue CAGR of about two to three percent, and over the 10 years, four to five percent. I'm going to switch gears now, and I'm going to talk about two other, the two other components of the nuclear operations group business. The first one is going to be our nuclear fuels, and the second one will be our uranium processing. Let me start in the center. You can think of the bottom as lo low enriched uranium is what's used commercially. The high assay, low enriched uranium in the middle, that's a new fuel which will likely be used for advanced reactors. There is a special fuel called TRISO, which is inherently safe as it's a coated fuel that holds the fission products within the actual fuel to create a much safer fuel so, so these reactors can be deployed safely and efficiently. And then when you get to 20% or more, that's highly enriched uranium, and that's for government use. And as Rex mentioned, and I, I think is a critical part of our business, that's a Cat 1 license that only BWXT has commercially. <clears throat> Moving to the left, these are our research and test reactor business. Think of these as developed fuels that are in manufacturing. And we provide that to a number of different research and test reactors and other customers. And this, is, this business is tens of millions of dollars, and it's stable, and it's steady, and you know, we would expect that to continue into the future. On the right-hand side, you see the development of new technologies, including TRISO. Today, we are the only company producing TRISO at scale, and that has been radiation tested. And we are in good position to continue to ramp that business. Today, the right side, the development fuels, um, are also in that tens of millions of dollar range. Um, but we're optimistic that that will grow, and I'm optimistic that that will grow over time as the advanced reactors begin to finish development, moving into production, and get into use. I'm going to now move to uranium processing, the last piece of the nuclear operations group. And it's the same here. On the left-hand side, this is our historical business, uranium, high enriched uranium downblending. That's about $80 million a year. We expect it to be stable through you know, the middle of the decade, potentially longer. And what we do there is we take HEU and downblend it to LEU for commercial reactor fuel, as well as other non-proliferation government, uh, for government non-proliferation activities. On the right-hand side is a new program that we have. Sometimes you might hear it called U-Metal, Uranium Conversion and Purification. And in this program, we take the uranium from the government, we purify it, and we send it back to them. That has to happen every so often to keep the uranium pure. Today, that's about a $20 million a year business where we're under contract to do the design and a pilot process. Our expectation is that this business over time will grow and will be very similar in size, scope, and scale, and profitability to our downblending operations. So I'm going to pull all this together for you in this chart. And this is for our nuclear operations group. And we see this business financially in three time frames, if you will. 2016 to 2020, as Rex mentioned, the earnings at EPS of BWXT doubled, and a lot of that was driven by the NOG operations. A number of tailwinds, including the Virginia Tempo, the FASCAS pension benefit, Columbia Development and Initial Awards. 21 through 25, we're expecting 
moderating growth, as I mentioned earlier. And really, that's around the Ford, the, the roll off of the Nimitz refueling, as well as the Ford ordering cadence and acceleration in the six years in between the, first, the, the last order of Ford and the next one before it goes to the four year centers. I will note that we don't have um, what I say would call potential upside in this forecast. Rex mentioned AUKUS. You know, we'll see what happens. The governments are doing 18 months to determine how they're going to meet the needs in Australia. We stand ready to support uh, whatever whatever is needed. We have the capacity to be able to do that, um, but it is not currently in our forecast as we don't know how that all of those discussions are going to roll out. It also does not have um, <clears throat> a second, I mean, a third Virginia or, or some of the other things that have been talked about over time. The 26 to 30, we expect to get acceleration of growth again as Columbia cereal production tempo and the factory gets full with Columbia. We start to see the SNX, which is the next Virginia development. Ford refueling begins, um, potential AUKUS work scope, um, as well as the increased forward order ca uh, cadence. Okay, now I'm going to move to our NSG businesses, our nuclear services group business. This business has been operating for 30 years and it has fantastic business characteristics. Typically, we use investment dollars to, cr to create the JVs, do the negotiations with our partners, and to put the proposals in. After being selected, these contracts are typically um, five years with various uh, time-framed options, which gets you to a total contract timeline of about 10 years. Sometimes um, you get extensions past that. So we have very high visibility once we win these contracts and very low financial risk. They're typically cost plus contracts, uh, fees, uh, you know, low single digits for some of the contracts and mid to high single digits for some of the other contracts. And as I mentioned, typically we operate this, this technical service group business through joint ventures that are unconsolidated on our balance sheet. We leverage our nuclear operations credentials for this business. Last point. Some contracts do require working capital up front, and we've seen this trend accelerate. Um, and typically, you get higher the higher fees on the contracts that require working capital. I think I hit most of what was on this chart in my comments at the beginning. We are in about on about a third of the major acquisition contracts, plus both Mashud and Stennis for NASA. And there are a number of upcoming opportunities that we see, and I list four of them here. You probably heard that we have won the Savannah River Site Integrated Mission Completion Contract, and we're excited about getting started on that. We would expect the Pan 12, Pantex and Y12 M&O award in fourth quarter anytime. Um, obviously, it's out of our control, but you know, that's where our, what our expectation is now. And then a number of other upcoming opportunities. When we look at the significant number of opportunities in this business, the needs of the customer, and what these bids require, we have high confidence that we're going to continue to see growth in this part of our business. You see, historically, in 12 and 13, we had peak profitability of about $60 million. And we, are, um, we have confidence that over the midterm, we are going to be back in that range. Really excited about the future of this business and uh, where we're going to be over the next couple of years. And the Savannah River uh, Award is just, you know, hopefully the first of many. Really excited about that contract. Switching gears now and talking about the uh, advanced technology and specifically the advanced reactors under the advanced technology business. We at BWXT operate in all these horizontals. We operate in commercial nuclear. We operate in SMRs, mostly through John's business, and, and he'll talk to you about that. And we have an emerging opportunity in micro reactors. 
Um, government operations, we're really focused on the micro reactor segment because this is the, the segment that we believe and our customers are most interested in because it really meets the government requirements to have remote power, um, space power, uh, whether that's uh, propulsion power or you know on, on the moon or Mars or, or something. So that's really been our focus. We are under contract, um, n numerous contracts for both fuel as well as uh, reactors. I want to spend just a minute on, on how we see and how I see the BWXT microreactor micro projects, kind of what their timeline is and, and how these programs and projects are developed by the government and, and how they roll out. Initially, you create an approach and think of this as analysis of al alternatives, looking at different technologies, different missions, different power levels, and doing trade-offs to determine what the best solution is for the, that particular customer need. This is typically on company investment, modest investment. Then you move to a development stage. Usually we see these as cost shares um, with the government, could, could be fully paid for by the government as well. And in this, you're actually starting to develop the technology. You're, you're, there may be some key technical hurdles that you need to overcome, that you need to demonstrate. So you're developing the technology. Usually there will be multi, it will be multi-award uh, you may have two, three, four different competitors going to a down select. Down select usually happens in the demonstration stage because this is a much more um, expensive to actually make the first of a kind. You might consider that an engineering development model or a prototype. And these are, are usually in the hundreds of millions of dollar um, kind of revenue and typically, typically paid for by the customer, although cost shares you know, wouldn't be out of the question in some cases. And once it's demonstrated, then you get into the program of record. And the program of record is where you would do serial manufacturing, driving down a learning curve, and deploying, deploying these reactors. And this is something that would be, you know, we expect, as I said earlier, to be winner take all. And in that case, you would, you would replicate, if you will, some of the dynamics that we see in our business that are important to us that Rex talked about earlier. What I show here are just the multiple customers and I would say our best guess on a timeline for the development, demonstration, and production phase of these programs across the different market segments, whether it's the, you maybe call it the, the Army, Air Force, terrestrial at the top, space power and uh, propulsion for civil uses, same types of activities as being space power and uh, propulsion for national security activities, and then commercial reactors, advanced reactors at the bottom. One other note on this, we are just one example of our leadership position in advanced reactors. We are one of two companies for that, that uh, off-grid and remote military applications, which is a program led by DOD, the Strategic Capabilities Office, um, and we would expect to down select maybe next year to be able to move into um, a demonstration phase. So that's the furthest along of these different market segments. So when I pull this all together for the government operations, so I'm, I'm elevating you back up now to government operations, we would expect EBITDA growth of about 4 to 7% over the medium term for our overall government operations. I've went through all many of the pluses and minuses, probably all of the pluses and minuses on this chart in my, in my remarks. Um, I would just remind you that, that that doesn't include an additional Virginia. It doesn't include you know, any significant work scope from AUKUS and some of the other activities which could create upside to this. And we're really excited because we, after the midterm, as I mentioned, we expect accelerated growth in the middle of the decade on. So finally, hope through um, you know, my comments and I look forward to the question and answer session. You'll see this as a growth business. 
There are some near-term headwinds, which is masking the underlying strength, as I have talked about. There's significant competitive barriers to entry in this business. We have decades of high consequence nuclear experience unmatched by anyone else in the industry. We're the sole provider of naval nuclear components, process and fuel. We are only the company to, pro to possess a category one nuclear credential. We have differentiated capabilities in emerging nuclear reactors, and, and I would say not just uh, nuclear reactors, but I talked about our U-Metal program, I talked about our new fuels for advanced reactors and many of the other growth options that we have. And an unmatched record in safety, quality, and performance, and Rex talked about that in his opening remarks as well. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you a bit and to share our vision for the government operations. And with that, I'm going to turn the mic over to John McQuarrie, and he's going to talk about our commercial operations. Good morning. I'm John McQuarrie. I'm president of the Nuclear Power Group, and I've been leading the Canadian business for BWXT for the last eight years. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to be talking about our commercial operations business, which we report as the Nuclear Power Group. That business is made up of, of two businesses, the, the, nuclear, the commercial nuclear power business, or the Canadian nuclear power business, and our nuclear medicine business, also known as BWXT Medical. Together, there are about 400 million in revenue in this year, with the nuclear power business being about 350 million of that. I'm going to present the nuclear power uh, business, and then I'm going to hand it off to Martin Coombs, who's going to present uh, the nuclear medicine business. So uh, these are the key messages that I'd like to uh, share with you about our, our nuclear power business. And I'm going to get into each one of these in a little bit more detail. Um, but, but here's the highlights. It is a highly uh, unique business. And as Rex talks about, like all of our businesses, we're, we're, we're in a very uh, unique position here in, in the products and services that we offer to the market. In the Canadian market, we're fortunate to have a very uh, long-term demand for our products and services that is visible to us over that long period. And we're also very fortunate to be lifted by a life extension cycle that, that we're in the midst of that is really driving additional demand. We're also finding that we're very well positioned to, to serve the, what appears to be the emerging uh, market for advanced reactors uh, with r many relationships with, with the developers of these advanced reactors and with the capability to meet their needs. And we're seeing that that is being driven by the global need for, for clean energy. And nuclear power has got a lot to offer that in terms of achieving uh, truly clean grids. So first, uh, talk a little bit about our, our unique strengths and uh, capabilities. Uh, so first up is uh, our customer relationships. And you know, I'm sure every company would say that, that that's a strength of theirs, that they've got great customer relationships. But you know, the nuclear market is truly different in this regard, at least from my perspective. What you find with many nuclear operators, our customers, is that they struggle to, to find uh, suppliers for, for their business. And they, and they actually are concerned about losing suppliers because of the high barriers to entry into this business. And you know, because of those high barriers to entry, it means that uh, suppliers that may be thinking about it are, are concerned about making that investment and not getting a return on it. And so, what that means is if you're in the business, you develop a really unique relationship with your customers. And if they know that you can deliver for them, like they know about us, that creates a really interesting situation where they actually encourage us to, to get into new parts uh, of, of business that meets their needs. And so that truly is a, a, a really uh, unique and important strength for us. There's two large customers in the Canadian nuclear market. We've been serving them well for 40 years, they know they can count on us, and that, that makes a big difference in, in our business. To illustrate the, this uh, sort of limited supply situation in a nuclear market, 
you just look at the other four points that, that we're making here on this particular chart, uh, in that there aren't a lot of suppliers for really important products and services. We are the only designer and manufacturer of large nuclear components in North America. So products like steam generators that are critical to a nuclear power plant, we're the only designer and manufacturer of those, those types of products in North America. We're also uh, the developer of the on-power refueling system for the CANDU reactors. CANDU reactors are highly unique in the world. They are the only power reactor that is refueled while it operates. And you can imagine that's a very complex endeavor requiring a really challenging uh, technology to, to be able to implement that. We developed that and, and that is providing a great deal of, of uh, demand in our business to continue to serve that whole system. So, we're the only manufacturer of big components. We're the OEM of the on, on um, power refueling system. And we provide field services and engineering services related to those. And of course, that makes our, our businesses unique because we're the OEM of that. We understand those products like no one else. Uh, and we could go into the field and do uh, work with very specialized technologies that very few others offer. So we've got very specialized field services. And we're one of two fuel manufacturers in the Canadian market. There's only been two for 30 years, and I, I think there will only be two for the next 40 years of operation in that market. So some very, very specialized uh, and unique strengths and capabilities. With regard to our strategy, there's really four aspects to our strategy that we have been executing over the last six years or so. First, as I said, you know, be the, be the supplier of choice. Have that great relationship with your customers. And that has really, um, really helped to lift our business. I'll give you an example. Um, there was only one supplier of spent fuel containers in the Canadian market. And one of our customers was really uncomfortable with that, couldn't find another supplier, just as I was explaining earlier. They came to us and said, hey, we like what you do for us. We want you to be our second supplier. We'll help you with the capital. We'll help you figure out how to, to make the product right. And uh, you know, we'll allow you to, to move into this business in a, in a comfortable, low-risk way. That's what we did. We now have about half that market and expect to have that for the next 30 or 40 years. So that's why it's important to be that supplier of choice. And th there's more examples of that. Second thing is that we've really focused on being a lean business, being competitive. Yes, we know we have a, a unique business, but we still want to make sure we are competitive. We want to give no reason to our customer to think about anybody else other than us. And so we've worked hard to be lean, and as we've grown, we've worked really, really diligently not to add overhead into our business, and you can see the, the margins have improved over the last six or seven years quite significantly because of that work to really manage our costs. Third, as we, as we could see this growing market in Canada, we've uh, diversified our business through acquisition um, mostly, but some organic means as well. And that's allowed us to really tap into that demand that's happening in the Canadian market and really grow our backlog over the last six years, significant growth. And now, as I said earlier, we found ourselves well positioned to be a supplier for future advanced reactors that Rob Smith spoke, spoke, about, spoke about. We've got uh, the capability that we're finding that these advanced reactor technologies need, either to manufacture components for them or to provide other types of equipment. I want to tell you a little bit more about the Canadian nuclear market. And really, when you think about the Canadian nuclear market, you can think about the Ontario nuclear market, province of Ontario. There's 19 reactors in Canada, 18 of them are in Ontario, so very much concentrated in Ontario. Uh, Canada, about 38 million people, 15 million in Ontario, so the most populated province. Uniquely, the electricity grid is 60 percent. Uh, generated by nuclear power in Ontario. So very significant uh, part of the grid. Um, and also very uniquely, uh, and I think not as well known as it should be, the Ontario grid is highly clean. So there is very low carbon emissions. At times there are no carbon emissions because there's 60% nuclear. Uh, there's a significant portion of that that is hydroelectric. And then there's a smaller portion that's renewable. So when when jurisdictions around the world talk these days about how do we take carbon out of electrical grids, Ontario has done it. In 2015, it shut down the last of its coal-fired generations, which was the majority of the generating technology in Ontario, at times operating one of the world's largest coal-fired stations. 
and uh, through a, a, what is, I think, the largest climate change measure in North America, it has created the cleanest grid. And I think when you look at the future, one thing you can take away here is that it's possible, but it needs nuclear power to achieve a low carbon grid. There's two major uh, operators, as I said, in, in uh, Canada, Ontario Power Generation, which is owned by the province of, of uh, Ontario, and Bruce Power, that's a private operator. Uh, we're located, our facilities are located very close to these customers, and so we're, we're able to serve them in a, in a very uh, rapid way. So a little bit about what drives demand in our business. There's really two aspects uh, of what drives our demand. There is a sort of a recurring demand for support as the plants are operated and as they have been operated for the last four decades and for the next four decades. This is uh, what you need to essentially uh, fuel the plant and to maintain it uh, as they take them offline for, for outage work. Uh, and in this recurring market, as we call it, uh, it, we need all of the products and services that we offer uh, to support our customers. And you can see some of these uh, some of these products and services up there, whether it be fuel, engineering services, field services, and various uh, components. It's a long-term type of visible market for us. We know when outages are going to occur. We know what the customers are going to uh, need from us. And so that gives us great visibility to that demand. The second uh, part of or, or category of demand that we see is life extension. So there's really ex extensive life extension program going on with reactors in Ontario. And you know, that is a, is a major undertaking. There's over $26 billion being spent on life extension of these units. And it's actually quite a long-term market, as you can see here in this chart, upwards of 15 or more years of, of, of steady demand uh, for our products. To be able to service this market, you have to know can-do technology. There's no other way to do it. And so that makes uh, inner, you know, good for us, but it's a challenging barrier to entry for others who would like to be a part of this growing market. So a little bit more about the size of these two segments of demand, uh, total about 1.8 billion annually in our estimate. About half of that is driven by recurring needs of the plants that are operating, and the other half by, by life extension. Now the mix of products and services that we provide to meet these two types of demands are a little different. So as you can imagine, in the recurring market, they need fuel to operate, they need outage services when they shut down uh, briefly to maintain their plants. Uh, engineering services, and sometimes some components that are replaced during those outages. Contrast that with life extension. Now, essentially what you're doing uniquely for a, can for, for a reactor, any commercial reactor, is you're essentially re renewing the reactor. You're replacing all of the core components, and that means there's a big drive for, for uh, the large components that we manufacture and for services related to install those components. There's also demand for, for waste containers because all of the core components that you pull out need to be put in containers. So that's very positive for our business. The one uh, a bit of headwind that life extension creates for us is that while these units are offline, the demand for fuel is less and the demand for certain maintenance services is a, a little bit less. But generally a very positive situation for us. You can see on this chart there's 10 reactors that are going through it, four for Ontario Power Generation, six for Bruce Power. We're just appointing, uh, approaching the midpoint of that, of that cycle of uh, life extension. So I want to turn uh, our attention to an emerging market that looks really exciting to us, and that is a uh, market for advanced uh, nuclear reactors for power generation. We see lots of signals here uh, that there's a great deal of interest in this, uh, certainly from governments. So we've seen in the U.S. President's budget request significant increase for funding for nuclear energy and for things like the Advanced Reactor Development Program. In the case of Canada, there are uh, more than 10 uh, reactor vendors that have gone to the Canadian Nuclear Regulator to license their technology. So they see it as a very attractive market for their product. The federal government in Canada has provided over $100 million in advanced funding to develop some of these designs. And I think most excitingly, the, uh, the largest utility uh, that operates nuclear power in Canada, Ontario Power Generation, has said that it wants to be connecting a small modular reactor to the grid by 2028, which would be the first of the kind for the globe. And they're, I think they're well on their way to doing that. In the case of private industry, there are 
a uh, lot of players that are developing products and putting a lot of money into the development of these products. We've shown some of them here. We're fortunate to have a relationship with many of these companies as they look at how they are going to do detailed design work for their components and manufacture those uh, or uh, other types of equipment that they need for these plants. So it's very exciting. It's not just uh, in North America that, that we're seeing this. We're seeing that the French have said they're going to build more nuclear plants, including SMRs, and the British have put uh, funding together and are looking to build an SMR in, in the UK. So it's a, it's a global trend that we're seeing. What's driving this is the need for clean energy that we're all uh, hearing so much about these days. And nuclear is a clean energy. It is a dispatchable, carbon-free technology. Dispatchable being a key word there. Uh, many renewables are not dispatchable. And so uh, when you look at how do you achieve what Ontario's achieved, you need something that is dispatchable and that's economic and affordable. Nuclear power does that for you. In the case of the Canadian uh, government, they're really leaning in on this. So there's legislation in place to phase out all coal generation in Canada by 2030. Not so far in the future, and I believe it will happen. Eight of the 10 provinces do not generate any power with coal. They're committed to net zero by 2050. They're committed to the Paris Agreement. And as I said, they are committed at the provincial level in Ontario to be the first to connect an SMR to the grid. So very exciting uh, market that we see here. So that's uh, commercial nuclear power business, just summarized by saying uh, really unique uh, products and services, unique strengths uh, and capabilities in our, in our business. We operate in a, in a market that is uh, got significant uh, long-term demand for our products and services, very visible to us and uh, significantly lifted by life extension work that's ongoing. We're well positioned to capture business for the next generation of reactors, these advanced reactors, and we think that's going to be driven by this global need for, for clean uh, energy. So I'm going to be handing it off to uh, Martin Coombs, who is president of BWXT Medical. But before I do that, and by way of introduction, I just wanted to uh, give um, you a bit of uh, understanding about why we entered the nuclear medicine manufacturing business. So as, as Rob Smith described in our, our government operations, we have this fantastic uh, capability around um, radiochemical expertise we've had for decades. And the very talented people in that organization developed a way of making the radiochemical that is most needed in nuclear medicine. It is the dominant product in nuclear medicine. And they developed a much better way of making that. It was a really remarkable invention. And as we thought about that, we looked at our, our business that we have in Canada and thought of a new way to irradiate the starting product for that radiochemical in a power reactor, which is a completely different paradigm than what, uh, what is, is the current practice. And we put those two uh, very innovative and disruptive technologies together, and we looked at the, the nuclear medicine market globally, we saw a very attractive market. We see a market that is growing, that uh, when we enter and have that cornerstone product, we're well positioned to tap into the, the other uh, growth that we expect to see there. And you know what we saw in that market a few years ago was great. What we see in it today is even better. So we're just as excited about, about that market, and that's why we entered it. So before Martin uh, joins us, we've got a, uh, a brief uh, video that will give you an overview of our nuclear medicine business. Nuclear medicine is the field of medicine that deals with the use of radioactive substances for research, diagnosis, and treatment of conditions such as cancer and heart disease. Together with advances in medicine, the application of and demand for nuclear medicine continues to grow with projected annual global growth of 18% through the year 2030. BWX Technologies is a world leader in the production and handling of nuclear materials. Our vision at BWXT Medical is to become a global leading company in nuclear medicine, developing, manufacturing, and supplying products for diagnostic imaging and radiotherapeutic treatments. We manufacture isotopes, pharmaceuticals, and medical devices, and partner with companies developing new drugs. 
Our customers include pharmaceutical companies, radio pharmacies, hospitals, and ultimately patients. We've backed our innovation with infrastructure, state-of-the-art production facilities, specialized expertise in contract development and manufacturing, and established channels to market to meet this demand. We produce and supply a number of nuclear medicine products distributed mostly within the United States, direct to radio pharmacies, hospitals, and research institutions. A selection of our products include Indium 111 oxyquinoline is a diagnostic agent used for radio labeling white blood cells. Indium 111 is commonly used in nuclear medicine diagnostic imaging by radio labeling targeted molecules for cancers and other diseases. Iodine 123 used in imaging for neurology, oncology, and cardiology applications. Germanium 68 used in generators to produce gallium 68, a positron emission tomography or PET imaging agent used in direct tumor imaging of the prostate. Strontium-82 is incorporated into generators to produce rubidium-82, a PET agent used in imaging for patients with suspected or existing coronary artery disease. In addition to these products, we offer contract development and manufacturing services to biotechnology and pharmaceutical companies around the world. Our services include development, production, processing, purification, and unit dose packaging for radio pharmaceuticals, from clinical trials through to commercial scale-up with an excellent record of regulatory compliance. An example contract manufacturing product is Therosphere, an implantable class 3 medical device used to treat liver cancer. BWXT Medical is under contract by Boston Scientific Corporation to supply this product. As part of our development pipeline, we hold patented technology that is integral to the production of molybdenum-99, which decays into technetium-99M. Technetium-99M is currently used in over 40 million nuclear medicine procedures each year to diagnose cancer, coronary artery disease, and other adverse medical conditions. Full-scale production will include BWXT manufactured molybdenum targets that are irradiated in a commercial nuclear reactor. Following irradiation and pending regulatory approvals, the molybdenum-99 will be processed and loaded into technetium-99M generators and transported to hospitals and radio pharmacies across North America. Once approved and commercialized, our molybdenum-99 technology is expected to provide a stable, reliable, long-term supply of technetium-99M. We also have several programs and partnerships to enable the development and commercialization of new radiopharmaceutical products, mostly for targeted radiotherapy and oncology purposes. Our vision at BWXT Medical is to be a leader in nuclear medicine, developing, manufacturing, and supplying products capable of life-saving results. And now I'd like to introduce Martin Coombs, president of BWXT Medical. Thanks, Martin. Uh, so thank you, John. So I joined uh, BWXT uh, just over a year ago. So I, I thought I'd start with why I joined BWXT. I've worked in nuclear medicine for over 25 years uh, in leading positions for some of the leading players in nuclear medicine. And there's been two recurring themes. It's been good overall, you know, good growth, though small. The two recurring themes, I would say, is firstly, a very fragile supply chain. You know, it's frequently patients do not get the products they need for their procedures. And occasionally, and this happened frequently in the last 25 years, there's been a major problem where shortages are all over the world. So that's been one theme. Another recurring theme has been the emergence of radiotherapeutics. First slowly, uh, and then very rapidly. So when I looked at BWXT, I, I saw, just over a year ago, I saw the solution to those two challenges. Firstly, on the fragile supply chain, BWXT's technology is dramatically different to the existing technology. It doesn't use research reactors. It uses powerful commercial reactors and doesn't use uranium. It's completely different and been 
a step change in dependability. And secondly, you know, this company, Nordian, has got the capability to source isotopes and manufacture sophisticated radiopharmaceuticals. So Nordian was a diamond in the rough, I think, and the acquisition was a masterstroke. It happened before I joined, so I can't take the credit. But I think it was a masterstroke, and it'll create a sort of beachhead to the market. So anyway, I joined just over a year ago, and working with my colleagues here and, and elsewhere, we've been building a team and building the company, and we've had some traction. So what I want to try and explain today is how we're going to make this into really two things. One, one of the leading nuclear medicine companies in the world. And secondly, the go-to company for pharma when pharma is seeking to develop new pharmaceuticals, new radio pharmaceuticals. So maybe firstly, I should explain what nuclear medicine is. You know, as the name suggests, it consists of two things. Firstly, a drug. And this drug is kind of like something that can home in on a specific target in the body. So it's designed to home in on, on cancer, specific cancer, or heart disease. And the second part is, is, an, is an isotope, a medical isotope. And you can choose an isotope that would be appropriate for diagnostic imaging, for visualizing the body, or a different sort of isotope with a bigger payload where the radiation travels over smaller distances to create a therapeutic. So the combination of the two is what we call nuclear medicine, and that's the market, covering both diagnostics and therapeutics. This is the market worldwide, about half in, in the US. As I said, it's been growing slowly over the last 20, 25 years. But we estimate it's going to grow very rapidly from here. This is independent market research. So at the moment, the total global market is about $6 billion. And the forecast is, the estimate is, is for this to grow to about $30 billion by the end of the decade, so within 10 years. So that's about, to save you doing the maths, that's about 16% growth year on year. And you'll see this is driven by the therapeutics. This is by new therapeutics coming onto the market. But the therapeutics are also driving the growth in the diagnostics. And Rex alluded to this. I mean, five or 10 years ago, diagnostics were used as a one-off kind of discrete event to stage cancer, for example. But now they use much more entwined with the therapeutic to select patients for treatment or to see very quickly who's responding to the treatment or, or if so, to, to switch. So diagnostics are also growing very rapidly. So it's a very exciting market uh, to be in and to get into right now, as John mentioned. This is the value chain representation of the different sort of players in nuclear medicine sector. So if you go from left to right, right on the left, you've got the irradiators, uh, and this could be uh, reactors, nuclear reactors, or cyclotrons, you know, accelerators. We'd irradiate the product, and then on the far right-hand side of the value chain, typically you've got things like radio pharmacies, who dispense the products into unit doses, for delivery to the patients, companies like Cardinal Health. And you get in more and more uh, drug companies coming into this value chain. Now, where we are is right in the sweet spot, right in the middle. We are nuclear medicine manufacturing, and we are taking the product, the irradiated product from reactors. We're processing it and manufacturing finished products for delivery to radio pharmacies, for example, and ultimately to hospitals for the patients. So we're right in the middle of this, right in the heart of this, I would say, and our competitors typically, uh, companies like Curium, Lantheus, uh, 
one of my old companies, Jubilant. These are the companies, these are the main players in this value chain. So if we look at this from the perspective of our company, BWXT Medical and Pharma companies, on the left-hand side, you can see the sort of things we do. We can source the isotope, we can arrange for the targets to be irradiated, we can do all the processing, we're FDA approved, we're approved by the nuclear regulators, and we can manufacture sophisticated products. We've got a rich history of that. So Rex mentioned barriers to entry. So you can see there's a lot of barriers to entry here when we regulate it from a pharmaceutical point of view and from a nuclear point of view. On the right-hand side, you've got the pharmaceutical companies interested in entering this, this exciting area who've got the drugs, you know, expertise in clinical trials. You know, they work towards FDA approval with the clinical trials and all the channels to market. But what they don't have is the capabilities on the left-hand side. So what we are seeking to do is to partner with pharma in the development of this new market. And what pharma is doing is seeking to partner with us. So we get a lot of inbound inquiries about how to take this market forward. This is just an example of some of the excitement around this sector now. Um, and this is from last March. Novartis issued some data to do with their submissions as submitted to the FDA. So this is phase three clinical trial for prostate cancer. So this is a therapeutic for prostate cancer. Uh, and as an illustration, we can see one patient, it's just one sample patient. And the image on the left shows a scan, it's a nuclear medicine scan, of a gentleman with advanced metastatic prostate cancer. So you can see the scan, you can see his lungs and things, which is normal on this type of scan for those who are not used to looking at these sort of things. But you can also see a lot of metastases, so the dark dots. Um, you know, this is, a, this is a very unfortunate situation, and this will be all of the different alternative treatments will have been tried by this point. There's no alternatives. So with this case, this particular product was used in three different treatments over a period of about five or six months. And you can see that this patient responded. So this is miraculous for this patient, when it, this patient had no hope. So this is causing a lot of the excitement in these new products. They're offering hope to patients who had no hope. And that leads to very high valuations. So these are some of the companies who have been in the sector or come into the sector. If you look on the top row there, you can see Bayer came in about 10 years ago when they bought Algeta. And up until that, pharmaceutical companies haven't been interested so much in nuclear medicine. But then Novartis came in and bought AAA for about $4 billion and followed it up very quickly with the purchase, the acquisition of Endocyte for $2 billion. So this is a big play into nuclear medicine by one of the leading pharmaceutical companies. Then if you look to, to the third row down, just as an example, this is one of the players within nuclear medicine, this is Curium. Um, they just, had a, they just uh, had a refinancing and evaluation, which is over $3 billion, which is about 16 times EBITDA, so high valuations. So where we are in this company, we're in the bottom row. Um, we've had experience in the sector in terms of target manufacturing of isotopes for a long time. But really, BWXT went into the sector in, 19, in 2018 with the acquisition of Nordian and really the investment in the new generator manufacturing technology. So Nordian is 200 million, just over, and 300 million in this new technology. So about a total investment of 500 million to become a player in this market. So I think this, this puts us in a very good foundation for going forward. So again, if we look at Nordian and what that gave 
the marriage between Nordian and BWXT and what BWXT brought. Nordian had a stable, mature set of products, you know, including Strontium-82 and Therosphere. And since then, since the acquisition, there's another couple of products that the company's managed to get it approved. And we've got the molybdenum and technetium product in development. And as I indicated at the start, there's a lot of core capabilities underpinning this. You know, the two facilities which are, which are licensed, the ability to work with radio pharmaceuticals and build new products, very skilled workforce. And BWXT brought to this the new technology that uh, John mentioned, a new way of doing things, totally different than what's been done in the past. And also the relationships with the NRC, the CNSC. So there's a lot to bring together. And what's not on the slide, but perhaps equally important, is no, to this marriage, Nordian brought the relationship with Triumph. So Triumph has the largest cyclotron in the world. And BWXT brought the relationship with OPG and Bruce Power, which are power reactors, and the way of working with them. So you can see this, is, this really pulls together a very powerful entity. So just something about people. Um, this isn't just nuclear fuel or reactor people talking here. This is people who understand nuclear medicine. So I've been in this field for 25 years. And in the last year, we've recruited a lot of people who really died in the wool nuclear medicine people. And two of them I've worked with before. So these are people who've worked for some of the leaders in nuclear medicine. You know, they're growing in their careers and they decided to come and join us at BWXT Medical because they believe we have a, a really high potential chance of becoming a leader here. And we will work with these people and they will lead us to success in this sector. Just to explain a little bit more about the differences between the supply chain. So there's a lot of information uh, on this particular slide, but if we think about the current supply chain, current industry dynamics. You see we've got radiation, processing, and then generator manufacturing. So this works almost all the time, but it's at capacity. And there's a few disadvantages here. One, most of these reactors are very aging. Opal is 2008, but the others are well over 50 year old. Okay. They research reactors that often don't work in a, in a way that commercial companies do. Okay. And they're aging. They use uranium, which is obviously a problem, nuclear proliferation. And there's some distance between where we irradiate, where we process, and where we manufacture. And there's a lot of waste in this process. If we compare it to our new process, when approved, we'll be radiating in commercial power reactors, and then we'll be moving the product up the road to process in Kanata, where we'll do the radio chem, radio farm, and generator manufacturing. We don't use uranium, so this is so many advantages over the current system. It's a real step change in dependability. So we plan to come into this market and, and really uh, have a big market impact, if I can say that. If you look at, this is just looking at the technician generator market worldwide. Uh, it's, 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 it's between 400 and 500 million worldwide, maybe slightly less than half in the US. And our strategy is to go first in North America. So we've got the infrastructure put in place now, really, to progress in North America. We can distribute, actually, from North America worldwide. This is what Lantheus does. So we can do that. But we believe also that having three solutions, one for North America, one for Asia, and one for Europe. So we are 
going fast ahead with North America. With Asia, you've probably seen the way announced a joint venture we've got for GMS, with GMS, which will replicate what we do in North America in Asia. And then Europe will follow. We'll, we'll follow Europe once we've achieved uh, FDA approval in the US. In terms of major milestones, you know, this is a big project. There's been so much work, so much work done, you know, at, at our various sites on this project, particularly in Kanata, but not just in Kanata. And we're nearing the, uh, the last leg now. All the equipment is in place, and we do a test in the cold runs. And we're going forward, and we will be doing validation runs. So we plan to submit to the FDA, submit application to the FDA, and as previously indicated, uh, and our plan is this will be around Q1 next year. Then approval after that is obviously under the purview with the FDA, but, but we will seek priority review. And if successful, we would hopefully get approval either at the end of next year or a little bit afterwards. So that's the timeline we're driving for at the moment. Um, just some examples, I think, some strategy in action. Uh, the first one, Boston Scientific, you saw in the video. This is, they've got a great product, this Therosphere product for liver cancer. And they've invested in that a lot in terms of clinical trials and broadening the indications. So we've come up with a very good agreement with them, which we announced earlier this year. And the agreement is it's basically a long-term agreement. It's a 10-year exclusive agreement where we'll be the manufacturer. And we've invested in automation and to dramatically increase capacity. So we will support their anticipated growth. So this is a very good product for us. And they trust us to manufacture their crown jewels for them, which we do. And on the right-hand side, these are some examples of the pharmaceutical uh, partnerships I mentioned earlier. So the top one is with Bayer. So again, we made a press release on this, and this is to do with Actinium-225. So if you've seen the press release, I think you see that we, uh, we indicate part of it is sourcing Actinium-225, and part of it is, you know, how do we move into actinium 225 based products. Okay. Now, what we haven't announced, and perhaps today is the first time we've mentioned it, is that we've got similar strategy and plans to do with lutetium. And there we partner in with another big farmer. So we hope to be in a position to be able to make that public going forward. But I think you can see our strategy here. These are the two most important isotopes in radiotherapeutics for the near term and the medium term. So we want to be having strong partners, having leading partners, and make sure that we can supply the isotope and we can manufacture the product and then grow with them. This is our strategy. We call this our ABC strategy. It's easy to remember. So A, achieve approval for our generator, for our fantastic new generator project and commercialize it. So we've talked about that, about that earlier. That's, that's well into hand. And we will, we will launch this, and it'll be a great success. B, part of our strategy is really building on our existing products. We've got some very good products. Each of them, I think, we can grow significantly. And, and Therosphere will be a good example of that. Another example is that we've got good Isotopes, ID123, for example, where we can make generics of those radioisotopes. So in the future, we will announce our plans on that. And then part C of our strategy is really all about creating and capturing the radiotherapeutics market, partnering closely with pharma. We're not going to become a drug discovery company. Okay, we leave that to the pharmaceutical companies, but we'll do the other things that we can specialize on, and we'll create partnerships that will have enormous value, I think, for BWXT. 
All right, let me put my spectacles on for this, for this chart. So, so here we're trying to explain how we're going to build this um, into a great business and what you should expect over time. So column A here is to do with the acquisition of Nordian. So this is 213 million US dollars. And for that, we acquired a company uh, with sales about 45 million and a beta of about 13 million. So a good beta profit, good beta margin, though obviously a small company. But all the cap more importantly, all the capabilities I mentioned earlier. And the sales of the former Nordian, if you like, it's 45 million it was. It went down a little because of COVID, or stabilized because of it, but we've been able to grow it a fair bit after that. It's now about 50 million, and we anticipate that next year it'll grow to 60 million. So this, then that'll be the base business before we start adding or overlaying the technician generators or, or everything else. So the second column is to do with our investment in molybdenum technician generators. So the target delivery system at Darlington, radio camera, radio farm, generator line at Kanata. So it's about 300 million investment. There's a certain amount of startup costs inherent with that, with getting ready, the setup costs, the people, what we need to put in place. And that's been about 15 or 20 million uh, for the last year or two. And so if you put this with BWXT Medical, which you should, you can see that business unit, BWXT Medical, you know, needs to be supported by BWXT by five to 10 million a year for the last couple of years. And we'll see that continuing also into 2022. And then just the third column is the early stage of the commercialization and ramping up of technician generators. So you can see we'll carry on with the startup costs, 20 million a year. But very quickly, the sales will increase, we think, towards 125 million plus. And then the EBITDA will be, start to become strongly positive. So what I should mention on this as well is even though this is about EBITDA, there will be depreciation kicking in uh, after we launch the product, after we commercialize, of about $20 million a year from, let's say, at the point of, commercialize, the point of commercialization. And then the last column, column four, is about where we see ourselves in 2025. And we estimate sales of over $200 million and a beta of over $75 million. Okay. Um, and this is driven by the generator, our existing products, and a very, very small amount on the radiotherapeutics. The generator will grow from there, and the radiotherapeutics will really start. This is when we start getting into our stride after 2025. So um, there's a lot of detail on them. <laughs> so I hope, I hope that made some sort of sense. Let me summarize anyway, my last slide. So as I think I've tried to show, we've got a very strong market growth driven by therapeutics. The sort of BWXT medical position, it directly addresses the current challenges, main challenges, and the future needs of the market. We've built a very strong team, and we drive in to become one of the leaders in nuclear medicine. And like I say, the go-to company for pharma. And right now, we're at the inflection point. And our view is we're going to build significant shareholder value uh, in BWXT medical. Okay, so thank you. It's my pleasure to hand over to our new CFO, Rob Lemasters. Okay, I left it there. Good morning, and thanks for joining us. First, I want to say how excited I am to be with you today to talk about the promising future we see ahead for BWXT. On a personal note, while this is only my second day on the job as the CFO, I have been intimately involved in BWXT the past couple years. 
I actually formally joined the management team, as many of you know, about 18 months ago to head up the strategy function. And before that, I was on the board of directors for about five years when we went public in 2015. So I see plenty of opportunity for success here and hope to help take this company to higher highs. So let's get into my presentation. So as we walk through the uh, financial strategy, I wanna focus on a couple different items. First, I wanna to bring to life the financial story around our growth. It's really, as you've heard from several speakers today, it's about our core growth drivers as well as our near adjacencies. Second, I wanna focus on how we'll be wrapping up our two large capital campaigns in nuclear medicine and, and the na naval business, and that's gonna drive a pretty significant inflection of free cash flow at the end of next year. Third, I wanna just talk about how focused we are on the long term. Uh, we really wanna set uh, um, and achieve all of our targets for all of you. Um, I would say that you know when I was in your shoes just a couple years ago, it's the vis visibility that this business has and the long cycle nature that I cherish most. And so I really want to deliver on that promise. And while there's been some volatility in the stock, we've consistently maintained our position with our customer and we continue to wanna to do that going forward. Finally, um, as we focus on free cash flow and all that we'll generate there, we'll remain disciplined in what we do with the cash once we come into all that free cash flow. We've consistently reiterated to all of you that we have a hierarchy of, of where we will deploy that cash. First, back in our business with low risk CapEx endeavors. Secondly, with near adjacencies on M&A, and then ultimately giving cash back to shareholders. So here's the impressive track record that we can put up on, on, on this stage that we're pretty proud of. As we talked today, we've had a remarkable uh, run of growth since 2015, growing the top line 8%, almost all of that being organic. We've grown our, our, our margins over 200 basis points, and we've grown earnings almost 16%. Now, I added adjusted EBITDA. As many of you know that have followed us, we haven't actually focused on this metric that much in the past. But internally and now externally, we really want to focus on this metric because we really want to be judged on what the core underlying growth of our business is. As many of you know, there are changes going on in taxes, pension. We talked about the CapEx and how we're going to bring in depreciation at different levels. We really want to be judged on what that adjusted EBITDA is. And we're going to provide you the drivers as to how we're going to grow that EBITDA. Remarkably, even that statistically, statistic over the past years has been pretty impressive and steady at a 10% clip. So now you guys have seen this slide in the past, uh, which is around uh, our medium term financial targets. As you know, last spring, we pivoted from just one metric to a couple different metrics. We wanted to be judged not only on our financial performance, but what we, what we do with the capital that we generate. And, what we, and, and so we, we came up with this sort of paradigm and I'm gonna walk you through the, the elements of that. First, as I mentioned, EBITDA is how we like to be judged operationally and how our performance is. We hope to grow that at a mid to high single digit rate over a three to five year time period. As you know, we anchored that on a 2020 basis. We think we can do that with growth across all of our businesses and minor uh, margin expansion uh, across the business, probably most likely outside of the Navy business, given how, how strong those margins already are. The second aspect of our medium term targets revolves around what we're going to do if we actually grow the business like that. What are we going to do and how are we going to convert that? We're hoping to convert that net income ultimately to free cash flow at an 85% or greater rate. A lot of that will come from the CapEx coming back down to a normalized level toward the end of next year. But we're also gonna increasingly focus on converting our cash through better working capital management. And then ultimately, what do you do with that cash? That's quite important as Rex talked about. We've made a commitment already of returning over 50% of that free cash flow back to shareholders. That'll come in the form of two things, dividends. As you've seen, our payout ratio of net income has been about 20 to 30%, the high end of that range. We'll continue to do that. And then we'll also look opportunistically to buy back stock. Our share repurchase effort has already started in earnest. I think people have seen that we actually had a pretty 
uh, large buyback done in the third quarter. As we saw the inflection likely to happen at the end of next year, we decided that with the dislocation that we've recently seen in the stock, we'd jump all over that. No reason to wait to the end of next year to actually come into that free cash flow. And we anticipate the stock to be higher anyway. So we decided to jump all over that. So we've made a, a substantial down payment on that commitment already. So now on that wheel, probably the most important one is how are you going to drive the, the, the mid to high single digit EBITDA growth that we talked about from 2020 to 2025. It really comes in three different components. On the far left, you'll see that there's a component of underlying market growth there. That's kind of our core businesses. I would call that sort of the, the, uh, the, the execute part of our strategy. This is around the NR part of the NOG business. This is around what John and Martin have talked about of our commercial businesses. We think that that will grow about, that will contribute about two and a half to 4% of our ultimate target of mid to high single digits. In the, in the middle category, we have what we refer to as the growth vectors. I think you've heard of a lot of those today. I'm actually gonna come back and circle up on a couple of these and provide a couple examples and a couple magnitude and timing issues that we have across this page. Uh, and then the, the last bucket that will be a consistent contributor as it has been, as I talked about on my second slide, we've had a history of driving operating margins. We have an effort that we've recently started where we're trying to get ideas boiled up at different business units to the corporate level to enhance our business, to become more efficient, to track KPIs, to focus on digital optimization. And so that will be a minor but important contributor that will look to, to, to improve the business. So now, as I mentioned, there's just three sort of uh, items that I wanna bring to life on this page because it is a little bit busy. Uh, on the left side, you'll see on our core business, obviously people always ask us, what's the NR piece of that? What's going on with that business? Those are your blue letters there. Uh, Rob Smith did a great job, so I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on it, but it's really a story of relatively flat volume over the next couple of years, led by the Columbia, offset by what's going on with the aircraft carriers. I think we've talked about that. Uh, there was a large two carrier buy a couple of years ago. The sum of that makes it a relatively flat volume for the next couple of years until we turn the corner in the second half of the decade. But that volume will be complemented by inflation. We do have the ability to pass along nominal pricing and we do have an ability to drive efficiencies with our pricing agreements. There is some minor offsets that we've been working through from a fast cash pension, and ultimately Rob talked about the fixed cost nature of our business. So that's sort of the NR picture that I just wanted to bring to life. I, th I think Rob did a great job, so probably didn't even need to reiterate that one. In the, in the middle category, another important item for the company will be what happens with the nuclear medicine business. The nuclear medicine business and what our forecast estimates here is largely around what's going on in that tech 99 generator business, the diagnostic side of our business. We have a very small bit of growth feathered in here for therapeutics and some product enhancements. But I would say that the bottom end of this two to 4% could be hit by what we see in the tech 99 effort. We have a clear line of sight of what we're gonna do from a revenue standpoint. This is a relatively automated uh, process. So we, we have a good idea of cost and so we sort of have a very good sense for how that will feather in. Now, I will note that from a, from, from a cost standpoint, we do have that startup cost that Martin had talked about, that 15 to $20 million of startup costs. We've actually been bearing that. I think that's, that's an interesting thing for investors to realize today, that we've been bearing that cost. And actually, at the BWXT medical level, we've actually been in the red to the tune of about $10 million of EBITDA that we anticipate changing as we go forward. We have some minor investment as well from uh, therapeutics R&D. So in total, that's sort of the nuclear medicine story from an EBITDA standpoint. I will just draw an underline under what Martin said about a non-EBITDA point, which is that we do have depreciation and amortization kicking in for the Tech 99 effort in 2023. And so as I look and take over this job, I just want to make sure that some analysts include that depreciation of 20 million there because that will mute 23 earnings. So while there's an EBITDA page, I just draw it to your attention that I think the growth rate in 23 from an EPS standpoint will look very similar to 22. From a similar situation that we're dealing with in 22 with pension, we're dealing with that with depreciation in 23. And the last thing that I just talked about on this page is what we're, what's going on with the space and defense reactors. I think there's a lot of enthusiasm about that. 
We've tried to be very conservative on that as a contributor. We're not sure exactly on the timing of how those awards will happen, but these are competitions that have gone from four players to three to two, and we hope to one, to BWXT. And when we're chosen to do those prototypes and to demonstrate that, that will be a winner takes all, and we plan to win. And so we're gonna put our best foot forward. And so we haven't wanted to feather in much profit over the next three to five years from those prototypes. Because frankly, we're just trying to set ourselves up to win those markets for the second half of the decade. That's our strategy. So in sum total, we believe that we'll be able to grow EBITDA at about a mid to high single digit rate over the next three to five years using 2020 uh, as, as, our, our, as our baseline. I anticipate, as I mentioned, 22 and 23 because of the startup costs being at the lower end of that range, call it 4 to 5%, and then accelerating pretty quickly in the 24 to 25 period. So let's take a look at uh, the firepower that we have and how flexible our capital structure is presently. We have the free cash flow that we know is coming in, but just look at our balance sheet. Stellar relationships with the, the credit rating agencies, uh, great balance sheet. We generally have run the balance sheet at about a two to three times leverage. Coming from the world of, of private equity that I used to be in, that, that's a very comfortable range for me. I think we have plenty of capacity. We're up toward the, uh, the 2.7 zone right now. We don't have any maturities. And ultimately, we'll come into very strong free cash flow, which will be generated from what's going on from an operating cash flow standpoint. We hope to grow that, as I said, just growth of the business as well as working capital management. But ultimately, CapEx coming down will really generate the free cash flow that, that I know you all are expecting. And so in 2022, our CapEx will step down meaningfully. We're guiding to about a $200 million number next year and ultimately down to a $100 million number, which is really our maintenance CapEx level. We'll continue to look for um, what to do with that free cash. We have, obviously, the organic and the inorganic initiatives that any company has. We don't see a, 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 a large set of, of projects nor M&A targets that will sop up a lot of that free cash flow. So I, I frankly think that we will be able to lean in on the return to shareholders bucket. So what, how have we deployed the, the, the $2.7 billion that we've generated since going public, just to give you some frame and what that maybe sets us up to do going forward? When you look on this chart, you can see that about 1.2 of that 2.7 was reinvested back in the business into CapEx, operational investments, pension funding, and then about an equal amount was distributed back to shareholders in the form of share repurchases and dividends, a little bit over 350 million paid back in the form of dividends. And then our acquisition largely came from, from uh, acquisition spending was about a little over $300 million. That largely came from that stellar acquisition we did with Norion and a couple other uh, uh, tuck-ins in the uh, Canadian business. So that sort, sort of sets us up for, well, then what does that foretell for the future? So our future priorities are, are going to be definitely to complete this Tech 99 initiative, which will wrap up next year, go commercial, hopefully toward the end of 2022 or early 23. And then we'll start to look at where else we might be able to invest in low risk projects within the business. I list a couple here. These are significantly smaller consumers of cash than what we've done in our two large capital campaigns. We're talking tens of millions of dollars. We're also talking a little bit of a different nature of CapEx. We, we see the ability to the extent that we win production runs of the micro reactors, or we see different therapeutics that demand a primary supplier like us, or demand finished drug automation to be built out. These will be contracted. There will be visible customers. We will align capital to opportunities, and these will be in the tens of millions. We also see this happening toward the end of our, uh, our, of our three to five year time horizon. So we're, we need to put some numbers around that, but that, that's just out there as a, as a priority to the extent that we win some of that. And then third would be that return of, of cash back to shareholders. We've committed to greater than 50%. Largely will come from, from buybacks, uh, and then we have some potential m and I have mentioned buybacks, I guess, a couple times, so I'll just spend a minute on, on how I personally think about buybacks, uh, per particularly when we line it up here with M&A. 
I think about buying back stock, not necessarily, it has an adjacent uh, purpose of returning cash, but I really view that as a way of investing back in your company. And I square that up with M&A. And so when we're looking at M&A, we're looking for interesting targets that have good business potential, have good value, have good management teams. And so when we look at that from an M&A standpoint, we, we compare that to our own company. And I think you'll agree that when you just look at the number of shots on goal to, to coin, uh, to, to use Rex's phraseology, uh, you know, I see a lot of shots on goal for this company. So we don't need to go outside and make M&A. We have a great target right here. And I happen to actually like the management team the best of any M&A target I see out there. But we will continue to look. We'll look at a lot of stuff uh, for M&A and probably do very few. We have an excellent M&A function. I've actually headed up that, that uh, line of business or function for the past 18 months. You can see though, we're looking for pretty interesting assets here that look a lot like BWXT. And I'm, I, 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 I share what you guys try to do every day. It's, it's challenging to find something that looks as unique and has the capabilities and the high barriers to entry that BWXT has, but we're gonna stay true to that mission and we're gonna add things that look like our core business. We're also gonna add things that add to our financial profile that are good growth uh, targets that add to our earnings base. And so you can see that that's our, really our goal and it will be challenging, but we will find it and mostly use it to accelerate some of the growth vectors that you have heard about today. This is a 2022 outlook slide that we presented with our earnings a couple weeks ago. We're here to reiterate that just to spend a minute uh, for those that haven't seen it, that starts with where we're at in 2021 with an EPS number of about 305 and building to, from an operation standpoint, building to an EPS that would have been about 320 to 340 had it not been for the pension situation that I think we spent plenty of time on the earnings call talking about with an ultimate target of 305 to 325 for 2022. As I said, it is actually pretty good underlying growth for the business consistent with what we talked to you about on the wheel, mid to high single digits EBITDA growth, driven by an overall revenue growth of about 3%, mostly coming from NOG and NPG in 2022. We have feathered in a set of expectations about the timing of Savannah River and other DOE wins. And so we tried to be conservative about uh, what that timing is, but frankly, that creates quite a wide range there. And that's why you see a little bit wider range and those positives are gonna be offset by the continued investment that Martin talked about. We have one step up in terms of our BWXT medical investment, that 15 to 20 million, as you see on his slide, did, is gonna go up slightly in, in 22, and we actually plan some, some acceleration of some of our therapeutics R&D. We're talking a couple million dollars. So that's the picture under the, the, the 10 to 30 cents. <laughs> then obviously you have what we've done with the share repurchases and ultimately building to, to the uh, underlying earnings space there. So in summary, we've got a very solid growth story anchored by core growth and adjacent growth drivers. We've got a good story around what's gonna happen with free cash flow. It's in our control. It will happen at the end of next year. We're gonna achieve long-term results we're not gonna be uh, swayed by, by what goes on in the short term as much as our eye on delivering great outcomes over the long term and setting ourselves up for the second half of the decade. Our growth will start out at that mid uh, uh, single digit growth for EBITDA and then accelerate and we, we have our eyes on that prize. And ultimately we'll be very disciplined with what we do with free cash flow and look to do shareholder friendly capital return where possible. So with that, I'll invite Rex to come back up and provide a few closing remarks. And we'll take some questions. Okay, thank you, Rob. Uh, we have uh, framed our business in this uh, expand, execute, expand, and explore rubric. Uh, and I think we've explained all that today. Uh, I would say that if you want to summarize where BWXT is today compared to where we started as a public company six years ago, I think it's fair to say we built the business that we set out to build. Uh, we wanted to expand these core businesses, thought we could do so, and, and we have done so. 
and you saw that in the organic growth chart that Rob just put up there. Uh, but we also thought that we could create, use some of the cash from these core businesses to expand into some new areas, which we have done. Uh, we've moved into micro reactors, we've moved into medical isotopes and other things like that. As I said in, the, in my opening uh, session, uh, those aren't um, uh, generating meaningful cash or earnings in the business right now, but they are future core business and very shortly they'll be uh, creating some powerful and positive financial dynamics within the business. And then we're exploring out there on the horizon uh, through our R&D campaigns and through other partnerships and we have line of sight into new shoots of growth around Theranostics and around radioisotope power systems and other things that you saw on that list. Um, and I think uh, to reiterate, recapitulate what I said earlier today, we've built a business that is, is, is quite insensitive to global CapEx and GDP cycles. We think that's a very powerful uh, way to think about the business and the way to build the business. And, and also a business that's less sensitive to um, defense cyclical peak uh, peaks, uh, which we may be going through right now uh, compared to our other defense peers. We have shoots of growth that are not related to the defense authorization and appropriation cycles. And so we like where that is uh, and think it creates a compelling value proposition for our, for our shareholders. All right, we'll now kick off the Q&A session. Uh, if you have a question here, you just raise your hand. We've got a couple people with mics. Um, as, they, as they come to you, maybe I'll take, I'm also gonna take questions online, so I'll start with one there, but uh, go ahead and start lining up the Q&A for the folks that are here. Our first question that came in online uh, is, is maybe for you, Rex. Um, you spoke a lot about growth today, as did the rest of the presenters, but maybe which growth vector are, are you most excited about, or, or which ones would you point investors to, to kind of be watching? Yeah, sure, Mark. I think uh, it's pretty obvious from Martin's briefing how much opportunity there is to grow in the, in the nuclear medicine business. So that's, from a market perspective, that's the one that has the highest potential. Uh, to grow rapidly, and we like our position there. Uh, we like what we've done strategically, and so we have. We feel like we have an opportunity to really grow with that market as it sort of more than quadruples over the next decade or so. Uh, I think it's also we also have a pretty interesting position in this uh, market around micro reactors for space and, and national security applications. That's a market that literally did not exist five years ago. There was zero demand signal. There was no 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 interest in triso fuel. And now all of a sudden it's materialized, it's there. Uh, and we see a potential demand from customers all across the government spectrum, DOD, DOE, um, NASA. Uh, so that one's also very interesting. Um, but all that said, uh, this you know commercial nuclear power business that we have really has the potential to grow around small modular reactors as the, as the grid is nuclearized and cleaned up. Uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, in the baseline foundational piece of all this is our, is our powerful naval reactors business, which is, you can see over that decadal view, growing, um, you know, 50, sort of 50% when you just look at quantity, but it's really more like 60% when you normalize it for, for uh, the scale of those uh, reactors. So I, I, we have an interesting picture here where the core businesses are all, are all growing and, uh, and we have new and exciting opportunities for more powerful growth. So uh, th that's how I see it. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'll take one more and then, and then we'll go to Peter. Um, this question's for you, Rob. It's uh, you know, kind of unfair, you just stepped in as, as CFO uh, just now, but, and we reiterated guidance today, but do you plan to kind of relook at guidance over the medium term or is there anything that kind of you feel is disconnected that needs to be reset over the next couple quarters? That is unfair. <laughs> um, uh, well, I guess there's really, you know, we're not here to probably offer new guides of any sort, but um, maybe I could offer a, a thought or two. Just the two dimensions that we talked about today, there is a medium-term guidance target that we have out there using 2020 as our baseline. Uh, I would make a couple comments there. I don't see anything significantly changing. On that, uh, we still plan to deliver that. I, I noted in my prepared remarks that likely you'll see an acceleration toward the end. It might take us five years to get to, to the ranges that we actually want. That's always a three to five year target. I would offer that. I would also offer that in the next year or two, in 22 and 23, we will probably grow at the lower end of that range, sort of a four to five percent rate of EBITDA. So I'd offer that. Um, 
And other than that, I would say generally, I also made a remark earlier, we're not here to give 2023 specific earnings guidance. We're focusing people on EBITDA. But if there was a factor when I looked at the, 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 the estimates out there, I would say that that depreciation factor in the nuclear medicine business and just in the nuclear medicine or in the Navy business, the sum of those two will depress earnings in 23. And, and so I'd offer that as, as uh, something that I would keep my eye on. Thanks. We'll go ahead and shift the uh, questions in the room. Me? Yeah. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks very much for the presentations. Um, Martin, um, in particular, this question's for you and then one for Rob. But um, you didn't mention, I think, you laid out, you know, kind of the challenges in the uh, medical isotope and some of the themes that you laid out. But you also, but you didn't talk about maybe some of the emerging also competition. I know Shine, some of the others. Maybe if you could just high level, give us, uh, you, you know, BWXT versus some of these other startups, how that is, uh, how you view that. Um, and then just Rob, on the on the buybacks, you you, you mentioned it, you compare it to the M&A back and forth. But if we think about BWXT the last few years, you've, you've reduced the float by about 5%. Is there a target in mind as we start to get to turn the corner and free cash flow and flecting uh, that you have in mind? And would you use leverage at all on, on the buybacks? Thanks. Can I take that, Mark? Yeah. yeah. So thank you for the question. And I did, uh, did forget to mention those points. So in terms of comparison with new competitors, and um, I wouldn't describe Shine as a startup. They've been going, I think, 10 years, and they've valued about 1.2 billion right now. But they don't compete directly with us. They, their customers are companies like Lantheus and Curium who manufacture generators. Our customers are companies like Cardinal Health or Triad. So we're a bit further along the value chain um, in, in Molly and Technician generators. So I, I'm very confident about our position. I think Shine is a fine company. You may know I used to be a strategic advisor for those guys. And I know Greg and Todd very well and respect them. And I think they'll, they'll be successful as well, but we'll be phenomenally successful. You know, we've got a fundamentally different product than Lanthius and Curians. Um, adding to that, you know, North Star is another one who's, who's I would, is more of a competitor in the generator market. Uh, and it is a newer company, if you're familiar with that company. Um, they, our product is a drop-in replacement from Curium and Lanthius. It's, it looks and feels the same. So we think getting radio pharmacies to adopt this will be relatively straightforward. North Star's totally different. It looks more like a photocopier than a technician generator and requires constant uh, operator involvement. So it's very difficult to see that getting any traction in the market. Okay. Does that answer your question? Okay. Just on the, the buybacks, uh, we have the target out there of returning greater than 50%. So we've looked at several different scenarios and seen what the free cash flow is, and we're pretty comfortable given where we see M&A going and where we see other projects that will have abundant capital to satisfy that. We don't have a target beyond that. We'll evaluate, as I said, based on whether we think there's a dislocation in stock and lean in appropriately. Well, also to the extent that we pass through a couple of years and don't need the the CapEx dollars or the M&A dollars that will lead in more. I don't think we have more of a target. You asked specifically about leverage. I don't think we're in the business of taking this into a highly levered circumstance. Uh, you know, we, 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 we pride ourselves on the consistent financial performance when you lever that up. I don't think that that's really what, what our management team's about. And so I, I think on the margin, we would take on leverage, but not push this into a highly leveraged situation. Thank you, and uh, thanks for great presentations. Bob Lavick from CJS Securities. Um, two questions. First, I wanted to start with a kind of allocation of R&D, and then I have a uh, isotope question after. But how do you decide on allocating R&D between the isotopes opportunity, which is a fantastic opportunity, and the microreactors opportunity, and are either currently slowed or could either go faster if you decided to allocate more dollars in that direction? Sure, maybe I'll start uh, on that one. Uh, so the, the way we allocate R&D is 
if it's, if it's IRAD, if it's corporate R&D, uh, it's based around how we built our strategic plan. We have this, um, this almost grueling process, very granular process for how we de develop strategy. And it starts with identifying the markets that we're in or the markets that we want to be in and trying to understand what we would need to do to either improve our competitive position or enter a market with a meaningful competitive position. And then there's a whole bunch of uh, sort of underlying material there, including the actions that we would take, the capital that we, we would allocate to it, and some of that involves R&D. So I can say first and foremost, Bob, that sort of 80% of our R&D allocation is highly correlated to how we build our strategy. We just know that in some cases we're going to have to spend R&D to get into a new market. An example right now is, is radioisotope power systems. We're allocating a bit of R&D to that. Medical isotopes were, were the same way. Um, in terms of whether we could accelerate and move into those markets uh, any more rapidly, on the microreactor side, I think the answer is no, because the pacing there uh, depends on what the government customers want to do. So we're in program flow with our customers there, and I don't think allocating more would improve that. But the place where we could accelerate, and we are in fact doing so, is around medical isotopes. So we're putting a little more steam, and Rob talked about this, a little more steam into uh, actinium, lutetium, the therapeutic drugs to bring those forward. We do have, um, we did, by the way, when we bought the Nordion asset, acquire some intellectual property around therapeutics that's turned out to be, it was sort of in the closet, and it's, it's ended up being a little bit of a bonus for us. And so some of that stuff's pretty mature, but we can accelerate that a little bit. Uh, we're also considering whether or not we can, we can accelerate um, the automation of our Therosphere line, which is growing very rapidly right now, and the market certainly will want it by that time. So, uh, so a, little, a bit of a protracted answer there, but it depends on the situation, and I think our biggest opportunity for acceleration is in isotopes. Okay, great, thanks. And then just one other question. Um, you laid out some nice information on the opportunity and the size of the market for isotopes getting to 30 billion by 2030 or something along the lines with growth in both diagnostics and therapeutics. Um, can you tell us where BWX will fit in that value chain and what's the, you know, that I, I assume includes pharma's revenue and everyone else. And so what's the potential opportunity to capture, you know, your share of that $30 billion market in less than 10 years. Yeah, I'll, I'll take it and then hand it over to Martin for any additional color. Uh, he, Martin presented a chart that looked um, sort of like a bathtub uh, where he showed uh, BWXT's position in the value chain and it's around uh, procuring the, the radioisotope uh, based material, doing the irradiation services, doing the chemistry to extract the isotope, uh, and in some cases going through FDA approvals, but certainly going through the nucle nuclear approvals and in the end, um, you know, at the end point of that, uh, contract manufacturing a nuclear, uh, a finished nuclear product that would go into the market. Uh, and when you're in that position in the value chain, which we think is exactly the right niche for us, then we believe we can capture up to 20 to 30 percent of the total price of these products. Uh, and so you can scale it with uh, with the market around around that idea. Uh, big pharma would be out there on the end of it, uh, large pharmacies and large pharmaceutical networks. But we're right there in the middle. Uh, in a place that we think really suits our capabilities. Martin, would you want to add to that? No, I think it's a good answer, Rex, uh, apart from the bathtub uh, <laughs> label for my excellent slide. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I will say maybe 20 to 30% is, is a good percentage for how the market will develop in the future when the drugs become more advanced. So in, in terms of the addressable market for us. But I would also say uh, that if you think about growth, a lot of the growth will be driven by the new drugs, which are driven by the pharma companies. Nuclear medicine companies will be continue to grow, but we'll have almost like a new arena of competition, which is somewhere in the middle between the drug companies and the traditional nuclear medicine companies. We're enabling the drug companies to enter this market. So our growth going forward will be somewhere between the two, I believe. But the addressable market will be 20 to 30 percent, if that makes sense. Hey, uh, good morning. Thanks, guys. Thanks for all the uh, good information. Um, Rob, I guess knowing, you know, you're, you're new to the job, um, but, you know, expectations management, you know, seems to be very critical, can outweigh actual performance. And, and just to make sure, so we're all rowing in the same direction, should we be calibrated flattish EPS through 2023 and then looking at that EBITDA off the 2020 base? It seems like even if you're 
three, four, five percent, you know, you get to like a 475 million EBITDA over that time period. Is that how we should be thinking about, you know, kind of the the expectations management here? I, I think that's generally right. I would say that for 22 and well, we've given, you know, underlying yep. guidance for 22, we see growing EBITDA at a similar rate, as I mentioned before, low end four to five percent again in 23 and then having that headwind of both depreciation. So you'll only get a, a minor step up. You said flat, but we're hoping to get a minor step up in EPS in 23. And then ultimately EBITDA and earnings start tracking because you don't have the pension headwind in 22, which is sort of a non-operating item. You don't have the depreciation headwind in 23, non-operating item. You're then kind of, it's all in the base. Yep. And then frankly, you start layering in revenue from Tech 99, therapeutics, mm -hmm. microreactors on a base of expense and depreciation and you're off to the races. Yep, okay. Uh, on that EBITDA, and I'm looking at the uh, the slide on page 69, you know, kind of the commercial and ramp for the um, the nuclear medicine, I, I guess you exit 24, you kind of have an estimate here, 125 million and 25 million of EBITDA. Mm -hmm. Should we think though the DNA at 20 or the depreciation at 20 and the AMORT at, at six? I mean, is that still an operating loss business as you exit 24? Or, or am I, because you've got total medical EBITDA at 25 million. So is it still running at an operating income loss? That's what that's. Okay. Is. That's right. Okay. That's right. Got it. Um, that's correct. Okay. Got it. Thanks. <clears throat> sure. Byron Callen, Capital Alpha Partners. Question for Susie first, although if you want to weigh in as well. Um, Looks like the National Defense Authorization Act is going to be taken up by the Senate this week, and the U.S. Innovation and Competition Act is going to be appended to that. Will that matter? That kind of sat in the Senate from last June, but it looks like there's a fair amount of money for things in your lane. And then a second question really for Rex and Rob. If you can talk a bit about workforce demographics over the next couple of years, I mean, do you think you're fairly balanced? Are there places you need to hire a number of people uh, because retirement's coming up or, or retrain people for some of these new areas that you're focused on? So starting with your NDAA question, the National Defense Authorization Act, it's, it's timely. We're a week before Thanksgiving because uh, Congress is doing what it normally does and it's starting to Christmas tree the bills that are passing through. So with the Defense Authorization Act moving forward, first of all, lots of good stuff in there for us. Um, it covers not just defense, but the national security aspects of Department of Energy, which of course is all of our NNSA work and naval reactors. So very good policy there and including setting the foundation for 25 billion above the president's budget request for defense, which has been mirrored in the House uh, Defense Authorization Act and the Senate uh, Democratic proposal for appropriations. So I think we're in good shape there. The um, what was originally the Endless Frontiers Act that was uh, a bipartisan bill by uh, Schumer and Young uh, back la in the spring and has been sitting out there with the House finally moving their pieces of it. When that moved and that was really targeted at countering China specifically on microelectronics, not a direct impact to us, but certainly we appreciate where the policy is going there. When that started moving, they attacked on the NASA Authorization Act, which is, I think, what you're, you're talking about as well. Again, it's a Christmas tree. They're throwing everything on it. Um, but very strong policy there. These are all policy bills. Um, it, geeking out in my world, uh, authorization sets the policy, appropriations is the annual dollars to achieve that policy. But very strong guidelines. Again, strong on shipbuilding. NASA very strong on, on support for Artemis, which is the, um, the lunar program, and then continuing on with deep space exploration. As you heard, we're working on, on the ability to use nuclear power and propulsion in both lunar and in future exploration. So all a very, very positive package for us. You take demographics? Yeah, and I'll take the demographics part of that question. Um, so generally speaking, we have a pretty even uh, set of de demographics. You know, aerospace and defense was facing this uh, famous bimodal distribution problem a few years ago. I think we're out of that. And if you look across our uh, age spectrum, it's pretty it's pretty uniform. Now, in terms of any hiring challenges that we have um, in this in this in this uh, interesting labor market, generally speaking, it's not it's not so bad for our company because. We're operating plants in Lynchburg, Virginia, Irwin, Tennessee, Mount Vernon, Indiana. So it's pretty typical for the BWXT job to be the best job in town if, you're, if you want to work in a plant because we have 
uh, good wages because we, we have uh, very, very generous benefit packages and because people can see their future. They can look out at the shipbuilding schedule and say, oh, I can work there for 30 years if I want to. Or if they're in the commercial nuclear business with John, they can say, oh, these re refurbishment projects go through the early 2030s. So I think people can see their future. These are very attractive jobs. And, and when we open a requisition, they're normally going to be 60 or 70 people apply to each one. Uh, so we've got some advantages just kind of based on our history and geography and some things like that. And, uh, and the workforce uh, sort of profile is pr pretty normal. I think, I think we'll take a, a few more online and then see if anyone else has questions in the room. Uh, next question that comes in uh, online is uh, about triso fuel. You know, why is triso fuel so important for these micro reactor programs? And, and really, how is it different from conventional reactor fuel? Yeah, so maybe I'll take a crack at that one. Uh, Rob talked about this earlier, but TRISO stands for tristructural isotropic. What it means is that you've got a ceramic coating around each little fuel grain, so it captures the reaction products. And also, because it has a ceramic material quality to it, it's meltdown proof. It literally cannot melt down at any temperature you can see for a reactor. So, so it won't melt down. It captures the reaction products. If it somehow got distributed, because the reaction products are captured inside that little shell, uh, then there's no direct um, nuclear material exposure to the environment. Um, there's, there's certainly radiation effects, but there's no direct environmental exposure. And so there's a lot of reasons to like that fuel. And uh, for all those reasons and some others, it's a fuel of choice for advanced reactors, for micro reactors, so a lot of different applications for it. And even in cases where it's not specifically TRISO, uh, BWXT makes other coated fuel forms that have similar properties. We might fly a little different uh, fuel form, coated fuel form for the NASA mission, for example, because of its performance characteristics. But these fuels are uh, uh, non-proliferable. They capture the reaction products. They're meltdown proof, uh, fail safe, and, that's, and all of those features differentiate it from normal nuclear fuel. Thanks, Rex. Get another question here. Uh, internally, and then I'll, I'll take one while, we, while we're getting the mic there. Uh, John, this question really really comes from you. I actually had a couple questions. I'll try to phrase them together. Um, you know, can you take a moment to comment about the range of outcomes that you know maybe BBX, BWXT has related to OPG SMR contract, and maybe as well how you see your business competitively advantaged in commercial but not just inside Canada. Yes, yeah, so for uh, OPG and their SMR project at Darlington, I think we're really well positioned there to uh, be able to supply design and supply components for that, uh, for that project. We're talking to all of the proponents for that project. Uh, there's a big buy Canada type of uh, view there that uh, we get from, from OPG. So I think we're in, in really good shape if that project goes ahead. Uh, in terms of outside of Canada, I'm, I'm fairly optimistic about that. There, there's a, a fair bit of activity uh, with, with others there that are interested in what we do. So, you know, not only are we the only uh, heavy component designer manufacturer in, in North America, but we're one of the few in the Western world. And I think our brand is quite strong there. We've had a good track record of exporting successfully to, to different markets. and. Uh, and we think that you know if, if Darlington goes first, then we're uh, through a learning curve that others won't be through, and we're well positioned to, to pick up on that demand elsewhere. Thanks, John. Pete. Yeah, Pete from Olympic. Um, maybe one for Rex and Rob. Um, guys, I think the next couple of years you're going to have some real nice free cash flow growth just on a capex decline. But then it, you know this slide 29 intrigues me because as you think about the midterm. It seems like from the medical and also post this kind of aircraft carrier troughing, it seems like NOG will be on an upswing also organic growth wise and just kind of looking at the Kagers, are you going to kind of return, do you think, to being more of a, of a growth business, maybe high single digit organic growth business post the middle of the decade? Is, is that kind of a reasonable for us to, to think about just given the way the profiles look? Hey, you want to take that, Ron? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I think, uh, yeah, as, as we exit the 24-25 time frame, we tried to, on Rob's uh, slide, talk a little bit about the sales dynamic over a longer period of time. So that was our core in our business. We then hope to accelerate with different fuel initiatives as well as micro-reactors. 
And so I think it'd be very reasonable to assume that you'd start to push up to that higher end in the second half of the, dec of, of the decade. Right there. Hey, thanks for uh, the follow-up, guys. Just on, the, on that same slide, 29, um, I, I just want to understand, it looks like you've got the flat um, units going through the facility at 16 through 24, but we've got, you know, that, that CAGR of 2 to 3 percent. Is that going to be entirely driven by pricing and an inflationary environment? I'm just trying to reconcile the growth trajectory with the flattish units. That's, a, that's correct. That's, okay. that's largely the case. Now, that's a sales slide, and right. that's the NR part of the sales right. slide at 2 to 3 yep. percent, which is relatively flat volume, a yep. little bit of inflation, and then hopefully as you transition to the EBITDA slide, you think about other businesses in NOG as well as efficiency that we can gain there. Got it. Let, let me add a footnote, uh, Michael, uh, perhaps for your, for your benefit and for others. <clears throat> uh, we're trying to illustrate there um, sort of a nuance in the delivery and ordering cadence of the Ford you know, we featured that in the past, showing a two to four units running through the shop. What that's really about is they get ordered on, historically on five-year intervals, going to four, which is going to be, by the way, a big boost to the business when that does happen. But we deliver on sort of seven or eight-year time frames. And so what that means is that you end up with a, a couple of years in every decade where you've only got one ship set going through the plant instead of two. That's really what that is. So it's just an artifact of the delivery and ordering cadence uh, and, and then you get this sharp inflection in the second half of the decade because it reverts back, reverts back, and then the Columbias are laying in, in on top and so forth. And we just wanted to be, even though the shipbuilding plan changes every time it gets published, based on where we are today, we just wanted to be clear about what it looks like today in our plans. And because that's a couple years out, the only other thing I would add, because that's a couple years out, we're, we're clearly aware of that, so is our customer, and so we're going to try to figure, figure out ways to layer that in, but we wanted to provide a very... Mm -hmm conservative outlook as we look over the next couple of years. Hi, so a, a question for the commercial side. Just from a longer term perspective, so whatever that the supply chains are all on our minds these days. So if, if you have Ontario at 60% of their electricity is coming from nuclear, if you had that scaled up in many more states, states, countries, whatever, what does that look like from a longer term perspective for the people needed to fulfill that growth or the financial capital or the equipment manufacturing facilities? How does that kind of ripple through and then not necessarily um, related exactly to BWXT, but just from like a higher, higher level perspective? So uh, in terms of the, uh, the people and facilities, at the rate that, that we would anticipate the demand would be there, I don't think we need a major investment in our facilities uh, or a, a step change in, in the people that we have. Uh, now that depends on how, how significantly that demand grows, but uh, right now when we look at it, we're well set up in, in both fronts there. Uh, if it goes beyond uh, power generation and into uh, decarbonizing transportation and, uh, and other things, then there could be very significant demand there. We probably need to make investments in both, but but at this point, I think we're we're well positioned. Did I answer your question entirely? Yeah, I, I, it was open ended. So um, I, I guess. Yeah, like just would other players come into if someone someone with a significantly larger balance sheet or something decided okay i want to take share um because they see this as being a i'm just thinking of spacex and nasa like someone who's i guess committed to doing things a different way or someone who's just very market share focused and not necessarily um maybe earnings focused. Yeah, I guess it's a tough, it's a tough question, so. <laughs> yeah, maybe what I'd say to that is we've got a significant head start, right? So they, yeah, there could be others that are interested. Uh, there's significant facilities that you need, very significant, and 
and there's a lot of know-how. Uh, you know, nuclear very specialized know-how. So, and customers are very conservative. You know, they're they're not easy adopters of new suppliers. So, I think it's uh, challenging for anybody looking to enter. I might I might add one more thing. Just changing altitude a little bit. If you imagine that the U.S. went to a 60% nuclear uh, uh, capacity in the grid. There are about 100 plants today, give or take, a little bit less than 100, and that provides about 20% of the electricity on the grid. So you'd need to build 200 more plants in the U.S. to get to 60%. And I think that's similar across the globe. And so if the globe decides to, to, to uh, apply the nuclear solution to the climate problem, we won't be able to build plants fast enough, build uh, nuclear plants fast enough, and there'll be, uh, you know, it'll certainly strain the capacity of all the existing players and any new players. So there, there will be a lot of, lot of room at the, you know, at the lunch counter for that, for that kind of opportunity. Um, thanks. It's slide on page 36 about growth in technical services income and approaching peak levels. Is that just a suit? Is that just incorporating the Savannah River contract at this point, or is that also assuming additional wins? Uh, so, uh, which which slide is it? I'm sorry. Um, approaching in services income in the medium term. Oh yeah, yeah. Approaching historic. Yeah, yeah. So we've built in Savannah River into that one, and then we've uh, we have a, we haven't been explicit about what else is included there, but there are a number of large opportunities, and we've put our best guess on what we thought we could win and bring into the portfolio. So some of that some of that's there. Certainly not the enumerated list of opportunities that we showed. It's not all there. But, the, but that, when Rob said it, Rob uh, expressed his excitement about that business. You know, the Savannah River one is a cornerstone win for us, and we feel well positioned on numerous large opportunities, and so we like our we like our chances there. If you look at that one page of the different opportunities that we have out there, you'll see that we tried to put some some numbers around that. We're in partnership with other companies, so you could assume that we'd be splitting those fee pools with a couple players. So that gets you an idea of what the EBIT contribution for any one, one, one win would be for these large ones. I think it's fair to say all those large ones are on the order of magnitude of 10 to 20 million of EBIT contribution to BWXT. And another question down here. Maybe one for Rex and Rob and, and maybe Susie, just following on to Byron's question on the NDAA. It seems like there's chatter on the appropriation side that potentially you could have a year-long CR for, for DOD. How would you handicap that? And, and how do you think about if, if we do get that, how would it impact your 2022 outlook? You want to take it, Susie? Yeah. Sure. So uh, I actually heard yesterday that staff has been told to look at doing a continuing resolution through February. Uh, my concern with that, first of all, it's not the way to run a government. Uh, continuing resolutions are not good for anybody who does government business. Um, so would love Congress to, to do a shorter term CR when it expires in December 3rd and actually get their work done this calendar year. I can continue to hope, right? But uh, if we go into February, my concern is we start to hit up to all of the primaries and the midterm elections. You've seen uh, the consternation just this year and the fact that uh, Build Back Better has sucked all of the energy in Washington out of getting almost anything else done. The fact that the Senate and DAA has been out publicly for six weeks, which they never do. They usually put it up within days of it going to the floor. Um, so it's not a normal year, um, unfortunately. Uh, so for, to your answer your first question, if we end up in February, I would handicap a year-long CR as extremely likely. Uh, we're also hearing that they're planning on 23, all right, fiscal 23 already being uh, through past the midterms because they, they realize Republicans are not incentivized because they're assuming they're going to get back Congress. There's no incentive for them to come to the table, particularly in the Senate, to pass the FY23 bills ahead of time. So... It, we're, that's not very positive. I'm, I'm hopeful with Shelby and now Leahy's announced he's retiring that they'll decide they want to go out and actually get the bills done. So let's hope. As for impact on us, we're in a, a, a lucky situation that the overwhelming majority of our funding is multi-year, right? So DOD and DOE have various buckets. Some is they have to spend it all in one year. Some you get three years, some you get five years. We're in that longer range buckets. So it takes quite a while before a CR really impacts us. Um, 
The disappointing part is, is under a CR, uh, you can't have any, <clears throat> any changes. Everything's based on the previous year's funding levels, um, not only in shipbuilding, but also in our DOE as we look at environmental management contracts or NNSA contracts that they all had increases. So those increases are now on hold. Some of that's been picked up in, other, in the infrastructure bill. But long answer to hopefully we're wrong. If we go into next year, then very strong handicap of a very long CR. I appreciate the color. It's great. Let's take a couple more online questions. Uh, first one here, maybe more for Rob or Rob and Rex. Um, talked a lot today about EBITDA is what you wanted to be measured on for, for results. So will we be providing those as kind of annual guidance as well as uh, segment level results for EBITDA going forward? Uh, we'll look to put that out for the fourth quarter. I need to take a look at that, but that's a reasonable assumption. And then for different segments, we, we will, uh, unlikely that we'll need to guide for segments, but it's very easy to look. We have, we disclose what our EBIT is, what our DNA is. And so you can get your EBIT DA by segment, but no, we'll take a hard look at, at offering that. We've gotten that suggestion from a few investors and we'll take a hard look at that. Yeah, thanks. Um, maybe next question is for, for Ken about, um, the recent Savannah River Award, when, when would you expect that to actually uh, start and, and is it still in the potential protest period? Yeah, there's, um, once, you, once you execute debriefs with the government, which uh, happened last week, there's about 10 days uh, that the government usually waits uh, to make sure there's not gonna be any uh, issues with the procurement. Um, but we've been told uh, that uh, we should anticipate our notice to proceed uh, soon after Thanksgiving. So we're anticipating that. And we're, we've been uh, planning and working on transition for uh, quite a while now, so uh, our team's uh, ready and ready to hit the ground and get going right after Thanksgiving. Yeah, so let me Thanks. just add a couple of thoughts on that, just as you think about this. You know, there's also a transition period that Ken talked about, which is about three to four months, which is non-fee bearing. So you'd be looking at, you know, the end of the first quarter of next year, maybe the beginning of the second quarter when we would start to see, you know, the ramp up of, of fee income coming into the business for that win. Good point. We'll take a couple more questions here and then wrap up online. Great, thanks. Um, I want to go back to the isotopes for a minute. And obviously it's very exciting to get close to the FDA submission for the generators. And if I could jump forward and just assume approval by the end of next year. Um, could you talk about the path to commer commercialization uh, when we learn about your customers, how their contracts work, and then the ability to take share? How long does that take? And just you know, kind of give us kind of the context of how you've already built it out in you know the slide that you have the you know 200 million, 75 million of EBITDA. But what what are the the steps and the ability to gain that share, assuming you get the approval at the end of 22, as we all think? Yeah, I'll try to, <laughs> try to take that one. Uh, what we've said historically is that we have a clear view of our channels to market. So I'd, I'd say that the numbers that Martin put up there, we're highly confident that we can achieve. And that's, uh, I'll just, I'll leave it at that. Martin, do you want to add anything to it? Um, I think you covered it, Rex. But in terms of the general situation, manufacturing companies in our sector will, will try to agree agreements with the radio pharmacies for, say, two or three years, typically. That's a sort of cycle. Um, now, we know all these players intimately, and we're very confident of our market access position, and we'll communicate it after we have FDA approval. Okay. Thanks. Just add, uh, maybe I'll add a little bit of color to try to link, because uh, specifically on that slide, You've seen the $60 million number building to $125 million of revenue. You can assume almost all of that is Tech 99, you know, some, some growth of the underlying portfolio for Nordion as well as some therapeutics as Martin talked about. And then ultimately you can draw a line even further to the, the, to the $200 million number that you have. Yet again, the ramp of Tech 99 is the large contributor there. We've in the past said that that total market is 400 to $500 million. We expect to address half of that immediately in North America and get a very significant share. So the combination of those two would allow you to triangulate what the sort of revenue potential is, and all of that would ramp in a very sequential fashion over that period of time. Great, thank you. 
Another question down here, <clears throat> Mike. Yeah, just for um, Rob uh, Smith on the um, on the micro modular reactors. I think you said a couple times it was sort of a, a winner take all kind of playing field. Are, are we still should we still be under the impression you could participate in three ways by being a fuel provider, component, and a prime, or is it truly winner take all? No, I, I think that's a way to think about it. You know. Likely, I mentioned our TRISO work and that we're the only company manufacturing TRISO at quantities and that has been irradiation tested. So, you know, we're, we're in a very good position for fuel. Uh, there's, you know, the different markets that I talked about. We're playing in all of those horizontal markets. I probably wasn't as clear about that. I kind of focused on the DOD one, but we do have contracts in all of those, whether that's technology development for nuclear thermopropulsion and fuel. Um, so we would expect to play in the market in, in multiple ways. I, when I was saying winner take all, that was really for the reactor design, particularly for SCO, because now it's down to two, and then it's a down select to one, likely next year. Got another question here from Byron. Sure, thanks. I don't know if you want to speculate on scenarios around AUKUS. I mean, there are a whole range of things that are being talked about, from technical assistance, even getting old Los Angeles class boats. Um, any way to kind of size or scale what that might be to you in 2025 to 30? Uh, we have declined to speculate on that so far. Obviously, this is government to government negotiations between Australia, UK, and US. Uh, certainly, there's a potential role for us um, given the propulsion work that we do, and we think it's an exciting opportunity. And, you know, from what you hear in the media and other places, it feels like it's maybe eight ship sets of opportunity there. Um, so, um, you know, could, could be very interesting for us, but we haven't built it into our strategic baseline and we haven't speculated about what it might mean for us in the long term. So uh, it's, it's just there. To be determined. Any other questions here in the room? All right. Um, maybe we'll take the last question. I've got one more that, that came in uh, online and it's a high level question. <coughs> Uh, more for Rex, um, you know, how, how do you see the company, you've been with the company now for about six years, and, and how do you see kind of the past six years and how it may differ from what you see happening over the next six years? Okay. Um, so I alluded to some of this in, in, in some of my earlier comments, but um, it's been a very interesting trajectory for the company over six years. I mean, if you look at, turn the clock back six years, uh, and look at the shipbuilding plan, and it was uh, two Virginias until there was a Columbia, and then it was one Virginia, one Columbia, and so on. So the, and then the Ford layered in on top of that. So the shipbuilding plan was kind of flat, a little bit of incremental volume around the difference between a Columbia and a Virginia, but the shipbuilding plan was kind of flat. At the, six years ago, we did not have disruptive technology to enable us to enter the, the nuclear medicine market. Six years ago, um, there wasn't such a thing as a microreactor for space and defense. It didn't exist. Uh, six years ago, to me, the small modular reactor market looked dead uh, because the market never materialized around the capability. And, and look at where we are today. I think, I think the small modular reactor opportunity is very real uh, and very near. Uh, we have a robust uh, business line around uh, microreactors. We have a shipbuilding schedule that has two Virginias or two fast attacks as far as the eye can see, and Columbia layered in on top and Ford layered in on top. So that's a real growth story now. Um, AUKUS didn't exist uh, six years ago. I think, uh, I think what you can say about all that is that uh, there's an element of who knows about the six, next six years for sure, but I kind of like that because our team uh, continues to deliver, to deliver uh, surprises to me, mostly good. <laughs> Uh, and uh, finds new innovations. It is a deeply creative team. It is a deeply creative team. Uh, and it's a team that has the capacity to act. Uh, and it's backed by a deep institutional capability. And I talked about that, all the plants that we have and all the capacity that we have. But we've got this creative team that can bring ideas to bear. I mean, I'll give you an example that excites me. Uh, we went up to visit uh, the medical isotope business at the end of August up in Martin's business to take a look at the state of the Molly project. Uh, and you go and look at the radio farm. Radio farms in this place that was not making it up two years ago in January when I last visited was a gravel floor with some cinder blocks around it. 
and now it's a state-of-the-art radioisotope facility, gleaming white with tons of automation, mm -hmm. terminal sterilization, dosing equipment. It's amazing. It's remarkable what's happened in the last 20 months in that business. We went down to Peterborough and looked at the target delivery system. Uh, that thing's an engineering marvel. I don't know if anyone else on Earth could make that system apart from BWXT because you have to have intimate knowledge of the CANDU <coughs> reactor, intimate knowledge of radioisotope targets and such as that. And uh, that's an engineering marvel, and that, that was put together in a very, very short amount of time. Look in uh, Joel, Joel Dilling's business uh, in our Navy plants. If you could get into our Navy plants, which you can't, but if you could get into them, what you'd see is you'd see us producing material and products at record volume, components at record volume, while we're simultaneously building out the capacity of the plant. We've got these plastic curtains up everywhere with duct tape all over them. Uh, and on the other side of that duct tape are backhoes and, and jackhammers and things like that. We're raising dust and creating a lot of noise and vibration, by the way, which <laughs> potentially affects our products. And so the ability of our team to take an idea and convert it into reality, to take on any hard challenge in the nuclear space and address it. Another example, we went from, from nothing to 90 miles an hour on this U-Metal project. We're making U-Metal pucks at, at uh, prototype scale probably six months after, after contract start. It's, a, it's, an, it's a, a business that has amazing creativity, amazing capacity. Uh, and so I think the most exciting thing about the next six years, in addition to all the markets and products we've been featuring here, is to see what this team does. It's just radioisotope power systems. We've got novel technology that bubbled up in the last three months on that. Uh, and we've got some business traction around it. So I, I can't wait to see what they do is the way I feel about the business. It's, uh, it's quite a thing, and we're well positioned for a lot of excitement and growth. Yeah. Well, thank you. And I, I think we'll end on that. So that wraps up uh, today's 2021 BWXT Investor Day. So thank you all for joining, and we'll talk later.